Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen uh, to the uh, planning committee. Uh, it's now uh, 6 p.m. Um, so I'd obviously like to start the meeting. Um, I'd like to remind everyone uh, present that the meeting is being live streamed and a record for publication on the council's website will be available. Um, with that, we'll go on to item uh, one, which is apologies for absence. Uh, Jenny, have we received any apologies for absence? Uh, apologies from Councillor Maney with um, Councillor Redsill substituting. Okay, so that's Councillor Maney's apologies, Councillor Redsell substituting, however Councillor Redsell's not here, so hopefully she will arrive at some point. Um, obviously if she arrives during the debate, unfortunately she won't be able to take part on the, the, the item that she arrives, but hopefully she'll be here any moment now. Um, with that we then go on to agenda item two, which is the minutes uh, from the meeting on the 8th of February 2024. Um, are there any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? I wasn't present, so I, I can't uh, comment. Uh, Happy, yeah? Brilliant, okay, fantastic. Um, item three, items of urgent business. Um, I have agreed to one particular item of urgent business. Um, this will be a red paper, an exempt item, and that will be the last item on the agenda. Uh, so we will obviously deal with that later on. That then moves us on to declarations of Interest. Uh, just before we go there, um, I have accepted a request from Councillor Byrne to move items 10 and 11 around. So item 11 will be before item 10. Okay, I've accepted that. Councillor Byrne, you can just comment on that. Thank you. Yep. I'm say I'm predetermined on 11, so I will be stepping down, but I will be speaking on behalf of Coringham Shop Owners. Yeah, and we can obviously slot you in as a resident on that on that item. So, uh, and we did receive your statement late, but obviously that was because of the conversations that were taking place over whether you could speak as a resident. So, thank you for that. Um, right, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest on any of the items that we're about to discuss here this evening? Councillor Watson. Is that on? Oh, sorry. So. I've got something to read out. So, although during the February Planning Commission, I, Planning Committee, sorry, I made statements in relation to a car park, Crown Road and Darnie Road, Gray's application, item eight for this meeting. I'm not predetermined. I can listen to all the facts and arguments presented and make a decision on this item with an open, with an open mind, and I will only take into account material consideration when reaching my decision. Okay. Thanks. Councillor Byrne. I have exactly the same statement. Do I have to read it or do you just take it? All right, okay. Yeah, me. Although during the February planning committee meeting, I made a statement in relation to car parks on Crown Road and Darnley Road Great, application eight for this meeting. I'm not predetermined. I can listen to all the facts and arguments presented to make a decision on this item with an open mind and I only will take into account material planning considerations when reaching my decision. I accept that neither the identity of the land owner or developer nor a proposal of the council to sell the site to a private developer is material and these, consider these considerations will not influence my decision. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, were there any further declarations of interest? No, okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for that. Uh, moving on to declarations of receipt of any correspondence. I've not had much this month, Councillor Byrne. Yeah, on item one, I've had phone call and an email from the locum, Furrox locum solicitor. That's for item eight. They've spoke to me and sent me emails. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Watson. Yeah, I've received email correspondence from a resident or for item eight. Okay, thank you. Any further? No? Okay, all right, brilliant. All right, we can move on. Um, just dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Okay, planning appeals. Does anyone, uh, Nadia, would you like to present that report and any questions, please follow. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Uh, the appeals can be found on item six, the, the appeal summary. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. No, okay, no questions there. 
All right, excellent. Right, we'll move on to uh, item seven, uh, which is obviously a public address to the planning committee. This then allows us, of course, to move on to the um, five items that we have on the agenda. Uh, we'll move on to item eight. Now, I wasn't present at the last meeting, so I won't take part in this process, although it's not a declaration of interest, so I'll stay where I am, and thankfully, Councillor Polly will um, uh, lead this item. Uh, okay, so with that, um, Councillor Polly, over to yourself. We'll go to the officer, Chris Purvis. It, this is your report, is it? That's correct, Chair. Do you, do you want me to run through the presentation uh, again in summary for the benefit of members? Please, if you would. Thank you. So this is um, Crown Road and Darnley Road car parks in, in Greys. Uh, we have a planning application that seeks full planning permission for the erection of a part five, part four, part three storey building to occupy the existing Crown Road car park and permission is also sought for a separate two storey building to occupy the northern end of Darnley Road car park. The Crown, park, Crown Road part of the development would provide 51 apartments split over four internal levels with 20 of the units being for affordable housing and the Darnley Road part of the development, um, two apartments split over two levels. So on, on the screen is the uh, red line of the application site. So it's uh, to the east of, sorry, to the west of Stanley Road, south of Darnley Road, and north of Sorry, Crown, Mr. Purvis, Crown. can I just interject? The gallery is suggesting they can't hear. I don't know whether you need to bring the mic a little bit closer or something. So the site is approximately 0.61 hectares. Um, it's, as I mentioned, existing car parks. They're accessed via Darnley Road, um, where there's a mix of um, public park in, in terms of pan display, as well as permit holder spaces as well. The railway line is to the, uh, to the south. Uh, the site is in the, the overall Greys town centre area, uh, with the shopping centre to the west, and then to the north and the east are residential areas, as you can see on the plan. Some aerial photo to show it as it exists at present. And uh, some 3D images looking north and one looking towards the southeast. And there's some site photos. So again, that's looking into Crown Road, part of the site. Stanley Road looking west into the site. You can make out the multi-storey car park on the top right picture and the residential properties along um, Stanley Road. And this is from Darnley Road. The top right is, is looking into the Darnley Road car park, as you can see from some of those photos. And this is from Derby Road Bridge. So looking towards Darnley Road car park at the top and over towards Crown Road car park at the bottom. Site plan shows the L-shaped large building that would be proposed over Crown Road car park. And you can make out to the north of Darnley Road car park, the other proposed building that would occupy that part of the site. Um, this is zoomed in on the Crown Road part of the car park. So just in a bit more detail, there's an amenity space provided at the back with a, which would be, include a play area as well. I think the landscaping plan will show that in a moment. Uh, but you can see the access to the properties and how the layout is where they front onto Crown Road and Stanley Road on this, on this corner. Uh, and then I've got a series of just the floor plans for each level. So this is the ground level uh, first floor plan second floor, third floor, and the fourth floor. So there's some elevation plans to show what the building would look like. So that's uh, looking uh, to the north, sort of from Crown Road or further back from that. Um, and then you've got Stanley Road at the bottom looking west. Uh, some more elevations, this is looking east with the, with the bridge shown and also without the bridge shown, Derby Road Bridge. This plan shows some de detailing in terms of the balconies that would be proposed and some of the ornate brick types uh, and patterns that are, are proposed with this proposal. Uh, and this is uh, an image looking northwest towards the site before 
and this one's an after shot. So that's how the um, corner would change in terms of viewing viewing the site, uh, as you as you see in terms of those uh, in terms of the proposed building on the Crown Road car park. And there's a one there from Derby Road Bridge. So it does project above the Derby Road Bridge in this area, the highest part being towards the western side of the site. And on to Darnley Road car park. Um, so part of the northern part of the car park will be built on. Uh, and this is a, a ground and a first floor unit. So just two units there. Uh, and another image of before and after. So before as, as the car park, as you can see from the car park, and that's after with that proposed building um, represent a bit of a continuation um, of the Darnley Road terraced houses to the um, uh, to the east. Obviously, this is a self-contained um, detached building uh, over two levels of, of ap with apartments. And then in the background, there's the uh, development over Crown Road, you can see. And this is the landscaping plan to show the site. I mentioned that play area and the, the play space that would be provided uh, a lot of a lot of work's gone into providing a detailed landscaping scheme, as well as increasing street trees. Um, so a big improvement to the um, tarmac and appearance of the site at present, which is, as I say, tarmac and hard standings that that dominate um, the, the site at present. Um, and again, improvements on the Darnley Road part of the site too, from a landscape perspective. And here's, here's some visuals. There's a visual to show what the site would um, would look like. Um, in terms of landscaping when developed obviously that's over a number of years um, and in terms of parking so you would lose all of Crown Road car park and you'd lose part of Darnley Road car park uh, the green spaces is the retained parking within Darnley Road the blue there is a proposed space for uh, a disabled person space um, and then there's two on-street parking spaces proposed as well another accessible or disabled parking person space and two spaces that would be reserved for a car club which forms part of the um, uh, mitigation for this application as well um, and there's a loading bay shown here but also the streets can still be used in terms of refuse access because there's, there's bin stores at the back end and in terms of the western part of the building uh, and the bin lorry and, and servicing can still take place using the existing road network as well as the loading bay the loading bay is obviously to take it off the main busier road here that's Stanley Road in comparison to the Darnley Road area so just to summarise, uh, this proposal would provide 53 apartments uh, making better use of urban land in this edge of town centre location and the introduction of residential development in the town centre has long been a vision of the council and is identified with various studies that have been produced since the uh, local plan was adopted. Uh, these include the Grays Town Centre Framework in 2017 and the more recent Grays Town Centre Study in 2023. Both help provide useful guides to this, but both are evidence-based documents rather than planning policy. However, the MPPF does encourage residential development within town centres to supplement existing town centre uses and encourages reuse of existing brownfield land. So the proposal accords with national planning policy and the principle of the development is therefore accepted or acceptable. Uh, as I said, the 53 apartments would contribute to the housing land supply. Um, and this is considered a high quality design development with modern energy efficient technology installed. Um, one of the key considerations, of course, is the loss of the parking, loss of Crown Road car, plane, which, car park, which is 96 spaces, and part of Darnley Road car park. In total, 108 spaces would be lost. But the evidence suggests, and that's the evidence submitted by the applicant's consult, uh, highways consultant, and that's been through various discussions and input through our highways officers. Um, the evidence suggests these car parks are not used to their full capacities and are and subject to the mitigation identified in the recommendation of the section of the report which follows the advice of the council's highways officers the development would be acceptable in highways terms and that this mitigation includes conditions but also section 106 contributions including the upgrade of existing control parking zone in the area the current one um, runs from nine till six it's proposed to operate a 24-hour um, control parking zone the provision of a car club and I mentioned those two spaces in the presentation and improvements to the current parking arrangements under Derby Road Bridge which be subject to financial contributions and for the applicant to enter a 278 agreement which is under the Highways Act for these works all other material planning considerations are considered acceptable um, and therefore the recommendation to the planning committee is to grant planning permission um, and that's that's the uh, presentation for you chairman Thank you very much. 
Um, I'll now move to um, statements from either in support or in objection. We have, um, we have one statement in objection, and I've been asked to read this statement out as the um, objector isn't present this evening. I think all members have got a copy of it, have you? Okay, so a statement of objection from Mrs. Stella Pritchard. There is insufficient parking in our residential streets now. 53 plus one number flats development in both car parks will exacerbate this with total loss of parking in Cram Road car park and reduce a high use 24 hour Darnley Road car park to a mere 16 plus one disabled car park spaces the latter having no current electric charging points. If a 24 hour parking regulation was put in place for the planning proposal, foreseeable problems will include no parking provision for all, including current paying par permit holders, and from experience will more likely cause vehicles to be parked and left in public access alleyways of Stanley Road, Darnley Road, and the wider area public access alleyways. Parking officers and the police have no powers to presently, to presently find or remove these vehicles. Residents would be unable to access rear of properties and access their garages would be profoundly affected. Legal parking may only be found miles away. Today, Residents of the Retreat and Stanley Road are impacted by the new developments on south side adjacent to the railway line by way of increased freight and train noise, fumes and vibration, altered wind vortex and reduced light levels. Residents will be further impacted by the proposed planning development of five, four and three storey flats in closer proximity, as realised by the above mentioned. Traffic noise will be amplified. Our residential properties of two storey high will be overshadowed and overlooked by the proposed build. Our open aspect will be lost. Mature trees and hedgerows will be lost and biodiversity will take years to re-establish. Stanley Road is a heavily used two-way through road with on-street parking and a major bus route. I believe facts, statements and figures provided in favour of this scheme are outdated. One example uh, on the design drawing presentation for the scheme at council meeting on 8th of February during the Crown Road frontage balcony design and co copying of the proposed flats. These designs were taken from photographed properties in Clarence Road and Bridge Road, neither of which are close or within sight of the proposed development. Totally different look with regards to properties in Stanley and Darnley Road, dating 1890 and 1891 respectively. This scheme appears unfit for purpose, is unsympathetic and out of place development, which if current government legislation still states would prohibit planning consent. Impact of this scheme will have far-reaching effects for residents and the wider community. At present, Thurrock Council is receiving continued income revenue from both car parks and current permit paying holders. This scheme at this site is objected to. As I say, I'm reading comments from um, the resident now. Um, I'll now open the application for questions from members. Start with Councillor Lydiard. Thanks, Chair. I just wondered, if, do you have any figures on the utilisation of that car park?
Thank you. Um, in the report, paragraph 6.18 refers to on-street on parking surveys that were undertaken in, on two weekdays. It was in 2021, um, which shows in terms of the utilisation of the car parks. Uh, Darnley Road car park did not exceed 83% of 24 spaces at any time during the day, and surveys showed mostly used at night, probably from residents in the controlled parking zone. Uh, for Crown Road car park utilisation, this did not exceed 47%, which is about 45 vehicles during the day, and in its peak parking, there were still available spaces, or 34 spaces still available. Um, they are the surveys that were undertaken, and there were some further surveys that referred to in the application from 2018 as well, um, but they're the most up-to-date ones that were referred to in the report. Thank you. Um, I'll go Councillor Shinnock, Byrne, then Watson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 39, 6.15, regarding electric charging points to be installed in the near future, I think this is something which should be done sooner rather than later because this is the road we're going down with electric cars and so forth. Is there any way we could get that done sooner? Condition 11 refers to the um, electric charging points. So prior to first occupation of the development, the details of electric charging points for allocated spaces should be submitted to and approved by local planning authorities. Then they should be installed, uh, maintained and retained at all times thereafter. So, um, so prior to first occupation being the, the trigger for the um, parking spaces, so before, any develop, before the development is occupied by any future residents. Councillor Byrne. Hi, thank you. I've got three, three comments here. Basically, was this, the survey was carried out during the day when most of the residents are, are at work, I guess, so their cars would not be counted. That's just one of them. The other one, two disabled spaces. Does that mean 51, 51 of the properties will not be suitable for the disabled? And the last one is, is this a box ticker for the... Um, bike spaces because you've got 50 was it 54 spaces for visitors and we're never going to see families going to give grandma a bunch of flowers and a cake on a bike are we so why do we need 107 spaces when people don't go out on bikes to visit family or visit grandma they go in a car so just is that a box sticker or is that relevant thank you thank you chair uh in terms of the, the, the methodology, it was done by the Lambeth, Smith, Lambeth methodology, which means the sites will be visited overnight when there's residents parking. So the, 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 the parking survey was done some of it during the day and majority of at night, particularly late at night, so that you're capturing the worst case scenario. Uh, in terms of disabled parking, that's the disabled parking standard for the development um, in, in terms of the requirement, uh, that would be open to any disabled user. If, 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 no. So what, what the situation is, is, is that if there was a disabled user, particularly in somewhere like Darnley Road, they could apply to the appropriate authority to request a disabled bay if a particular but it, unfortunately, all disabled bays are open to anybody. We can't specifically designate a disabled bay to a, a particular user. In terms of the cycle parking, as an authority, we're trying to encourage use of alternative transport modes. So if they want to provide more than the, the, the allocation of cycle parking, as long as they're providing the main allocation in terms of the residence allocation, and if they're providing more from a visitor's type of view, that's acceptable in, in fact. We'd rather have more than less. Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Um, can we go back to the car park bit? Now, 
it's quite obvious that some of the residents are parking in that car park spaces. For the reason being, they are saying that there is not enough car park spacing on the actual road for them to actually park outside their houses. So if this is, is what they're saying, and we need to consider this, what are we going to do to mitigate that loss of car park spaces for them? So currently, the the, the car the Darnley Road car park is 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 a combined car park and residence parking. So they can actually, with their residence parking permit, park on the road, and in in the car park. So there will be those spaces remaining in the car park, which will be of the similar designation. They will be residence parking and car parking spaces. Plus, we've additionally asked that the, the spaces under the bridge are improved because there's 24 spaces there's 24 under there, which obviously currently, because of the, the, the way it looks and it's not very lit very well, it's not that secure, uh, residents don't park under there. But we've asked that that's significantly improved, lit better, secured better, so that that, that gives the, uh, those, uh, if you like, additional spaces on top of the 15 spaces that are allocated as part of the development. That, from looking at the st study, that seems to be more than there's particularly need than's needed, particularly overnight in terms of the overnight parking. So under the bridge, we are going to secure it properly because I don't think I'll be wanting to park my car on the bridge. <laughs> Well, I'm just slightly yeah, we, concerned. We were talking about CCTV and, and appropriate lighting so that, that it's appropriately m monitored. Right, okay. Councillor Piccolo. Oh, thank you, Chair. A um, couple of things. <coughs> First of all, can we get out of our brains that we've got good transport links? We've got good transport links to South End and London. If you want to go anywhere else, we haven't got good transport links. So, you know, there are going to be needs for people to go um, Brentwood and other directions, and, and, and the transport links are, are, are really poor there. So I'd just like to get off of us. The other thing I just want to question is there's going to be a need to put in parking restrictions um, or change the parking areas relating to this scheme. If it was a private developer, would they be in a position to make changes or request changes to the parking regulations in the area? Um, if it was a private development, we, we would still set the same, potentially set the same mitigation measures, whether it is private or a public. So if, 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 if a private developer came in, came in, we would be asking the same mitigation that, that the, the CPZ be turned from a, a nine to six, Monday to Saturday or whatever it is at the moment, to a full 24 hours. So that means the only, the only people that could park in that area would be residents or residents, visitors. So overnight, the only people that could park in the area would be a resident or a residence visitor. Can I just say, that wasn't my question. My question was, could a private developer get that legislation or get that, that, that ruling changed to put in force those parking restrictions? Uh, the, the answer to that is, no, because the 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 the, 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 so the, the, the local authority make the, the the traffic orders, but we could obviously put a put a, a condition that that, that no, the parking okay. restrictions so, are so changed. You've asked me questions. All I want to yeah. know. Councillor Byrne. At the, la the last meeting, there was two residents that complained, two houses that said it was on the car park and they were going to lose their space. Is that still on this or has it that been dropped? There's been no changes since the last application as far, far as I'm aware. Are the, 
are we are we saying they're act, they're, they're actual spaces or are they public spaces that they use? can't say that I recall that question but we do have a co-opted member um, online on MST can I just ask if Mr Taylor has got any questions Stephen you're on mute Steve, can you hear us at all? If you are, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Well, I didn't say anything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't see you on screen, Mr Taylor. I was just checking if you had any questions for the officers. I can hear you loud and clear. Sorry, Councillor Watson, did you want to come back? Thank you. Can I just ask a, a quick question in terms of um, the size of these buildings? There has been a right of light survey carried out, so, that it, so it doesn't affect any of the houses that are out the outside, because these are quite significant tall buildings by the side of a house in. Yes, the, in the, the report refers to the um, assessment that was undertaken and obviously the distances involved to those properties in, in Darnley Road and one in Stanley Road. Um, it's significantly distant enough to, to not affect their amenity. The building is obviously, in terms of Crown Road, building is obviously set forward in terms of the front uh, elevation, fronting onto Crown Road and, and, and Stanley Road, and behind that you've got an amenity space, so there is sufficient distances be between to ensure there, there wouldn't be any um, significant loss of light or, or amenity aspects uh, in, re in relation to those existing properties and the, the amenities of those neighbours. So, Julian, just to follow up on Councillor Burns' uh, question, there, there is two houses that has got no parking outside their house at all, and they are using the car park to for them to park during the night um, even with all the best will in the world there is quite a significant amount of car park in there i will pretty much sure that will be um filled up quite immediately because i know we're trying to get an alternative travel but realistically most houses have two cars now i know you might not have because you keep telling me but two but <laughs> but <laughs> most have like two cars um, and so that will go quite quickly so I'm just a bit concerned about the parking for these two houses that hasn't got anything okay so the 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 applicants did a parking study of the whole of the the, the parking area including all the, the residents parking in in several of the road adjacent roads and quite a, a large extent so that's the most of the zone that w that 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 the Darnley Road car park falls in and there's an underutilization overall in the the whole of the car parking so potentially that there will be parking somewhere with, within the zone ideally obviously as close as possible but overall the whole capacity of the the road and mm -hmm. the car parks that are left and we, that's not counting the tw the 24 that we've asked so the original application didn't include the the count didn't include the car park underneath the bridge so that's why we've asked that obviously that be included now and that that be better 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 wise security wise but overall that the, the capacity within the whole of the zone and that's one of the reasons for suggesting the mitigation of 24 hour so that then prevents overnight those parking spaces being used by or the ordinary member of the public so they so if somebody for instance was going to the theater or something then they'd have to park in one of the other car parks because they wouldn't be able to park on the road because that would be a 24 hour so that that would be reserved for residents so i want to ask a completely different question chair is that all right 
Um, I want to know about the planning conditions around the affordability of this, because uh, more in the tenure side of stuff. So we've got private sale, 33, and we've got affordable, five, five of those affordable go to shared ownership. What conditions can we put in place to ensure that happens and continue to happen if this is ever um, sold to someone else? So basically what I'm asking is um, can we put a, a planning condition that it will remain as the same tenure as it is a good scheme for that sort of tenure? The planning application um, actually looks at uh, section 106 in terms of the affordable housing, and that affordable housing will, will meet the housing team's requirements in terms of affordable housing, uh, the current standards and, and policy in terms of tenure and, um, and what is required. Um, I haven't got all the details within this report, but the, um, the affordable housing would be secured through um, a section 106 instead of a, um, uh, a planning condition, which is how we always deal with affordable housing. And that for, it goes into the 106 and it becomes part of the planning permission and that's what um, will, will, will therefore be what's in place going forward unless someone comes in to change it in the future. We're not suggesting that is the case, but if they would, there is, a, no, there is another application process for that to follow. So other, in other words, the um, affordable housing will follow the um, current requirements of the council's housing team. And am I, sorry Chair, is that all right? That's a quick. So I might then write to say that if anybody at any time wants to change a tenure for any reason, i.e. there is there's an, an added bill cost, that that will not be affecting any of the tenure at all, like we've seen in some others that's happened here, to offset additional construction costs. Maybe housing might be able to tell me if you can't, Chris. Possibly, I think um, I think what you probably what you're getting about is getting at is if, if if a private developer came in perhaps and uh, decided to change the level of affordable housing, if that was to happen, there'd be a separate planning application to do that, and the section 106 would need to be modified from what we're seeking to agree now, which is as I say, meeting the current housing requirements in terms of tenure um, and affordable housing requirements. Does any other member have any questions? Uh, on that note, then, I'll open the uh, application up for debate. Got any members wishing to speak? Councillor Piccolo. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I've got a big problem with this. Um, not massively on the design, but more on a matter of principle, in so much as this was a private developer coming forward with this scheme, um, we as a committee would probably look and say, well, you can't guarantee you're going to get this parking that you're saying is going to be there. Um, and I think that is giving us as the, as the, as the developer an unfair advantage. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to go along with something where um, it's not an even playing field for everybody. Um, as I say, that's, that's, my, that's my one and only, well, it's not my one and only concern. Um, I think it's two iron are overlooking. But my major concern is, is that we're giving something to ourselves that we couldn't give to a private developer. Um, and I've, I've just been trying to get through. Have we actually put in as, as the developer or if we are using a managing agent to do it. Chairman, the application is made by the housing team, so there isn't, there isn't a developer on board at the moment, as, as obviously discussed last time at committee, in terms of the council's intention to sell this site in the future. Um, this is obviously securing, looking to secure a planning permission that goes with the land, and that's where planning permission goes with, rather than with individual um, applicants and things like that, it goes with the land. So whatever happens in the future, it will be with the land, there'll be a planning permission, and whether it's the council that implement it or somebody else, they'll have to stick to that planning permission or they make another planning application. Okay, thank you, Chair. I say, I, I, I'm, I'm still not happy with the fact that um, this planning permission could go through um, with, on the understanding of the uh, um, 
with us giving ourselves a, 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 an undue benefit that wouldn't be given to a private developer in so much as um, utilising public space for parking for the development, uh, where I say a private developer couldn't do that. Thank you. Would you like to come back? Uh, all I would say is that we look at a planning application on its plan, planning merits, not on who the applicant is. So it would be no different in terms of how we would assess it if a private person put in an application or a public. And that's for all applications we look at, whether they're private or they're public. We, 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 make, we, make, no, we make no difference when we're doing our transport assessments. You want yeah, if I could just back, come back Councilor on that, yeah. Um, so you're saying that if a private developer had put this application in and said, oh, oh by the way, it relies on me getting um, on-street parking in places that an actual doesn't exist and putting in parking restrictions that at present don't exist, um, that would be okay. You'd, you'd say that that, when it came to a planning statement, you'd say, or the committee, you'd say that's quite acceptable. Um, it could possibly happen. Um, because I say at the moment, I can't see how, I, I believe we're giving ourselves an unfair advantage and I don't think that's what the committee is here to do. We should be looking at everything on a level playing field. And that's my personal opinion there, whether anybody else agree on it, I don't know. Does any other member wish to debate? on this. Councillor Watson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm a bit along the same line as Councillor Piccolo. However, the bit that also I'm quite worried about is the parking aspect of it, because it is still being used. And even if we, we're going to dislodge those cars somewhere else, and they're going to end up being parking all the way around that area. So we're going to then go into a CPZ that, you know, may or not be happy the residents might not plan a permit if it's already there. And then we're talking about securing them underneath a, a bridge, which um, personally I wouldn't park, but the, they might do. In terms of the two houses that haven't got car parks as well, can we give them dedicated car parking spaces within the development so it is actually theirs? Because they are the ones that's going to be actually left out. And what I'm, I'm talking about is like, Park number number one and two is bay is for those individuals only. Mm. Because I am worried about the displacement of the cars already. If there's already a lot going there, we're going to additionally add in there potentially another fifty odd cars. Or more. Uh, as far as I'm aware, in traffic regulation or law there isn't the ability to dedicate spaces to a particular person. That's why I said in terms of the same thing as a disabled parking bay, you can't dedicate it to a particular disabled user. You can only have it as open use. So it would be an open residential use. So why not? Because if it was a private development, they do actually do dedicated park car parking spaces. So why can't we give dedicated car park spaces to two of our residents that those buildings have been there since 1890. <laughs> if it's housing land, then that, that would be up to the housing team where they allocated. But if it's public open space or public land, then the answer is the traffic regulations don't allow us to do that. So that's why a private developer can obviously allocate spaces because they're private spaces that there is no regulation on them other than their own allocation of spaces but in in a public space you can't allocate spaces you can allocate it to a use but you can't allocate it to a person has everybody had sufficient time to debate and consider the application. I think 
there's some concerns being raised there, but one thing that I do think that Tarot do quite well is pre-planning application conversations with developers. And if there had have been, if this had come from outside of the authority, those issues around the parking provision that Councillor Piccolo seems to be concerned about would, would have been discussed in the pre-application um, meetings that uh, and if they weren't able to find a resolve, I think it, then the perhaps the, the recommendation may have been different. But all that said, I, I'm I'm minded to uh, the application recommendation is for approval, and uh, I am going to move for in favour of that recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Lydiard, all those in favour? Those against? Against? Yeah, thank you. So, on Councillor Redsall? Can I just say, just for the purpose of the public, I can't vote on this because it was deferred last time. So, just so in a general public know, I'm not just sitting here for fun. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarifying cl clarification, Councillor Ridsall, and we do appreciate that you've been able to substitute for Councillor Maney, and that, that was mentioned by a chair at the beginning of the meeting, that um, you would be joining us, but not able to vote. But always good to make sure we are open and transparent. Um, that said, uh, we, the application is approved. For Back to chair. Okay, thank you everyone for your contributions on that particular item. That then takes us on to agenda item nine, which is 10 Chestnut Avenue. Um, Nadia, if you'd be so kind as to uh, present your report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. I'm just um, sharing my screen and hopefully Good evening, members of the public. Hopefully, you can you hear me okay? Excellent. No, thank you. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so I'm sharing the screen now, so that can all be seen. Thanks. So 10 Chestnut Avenue, this application um, has been called in by councillors to consider the design and character impact upon the street scene. A couple of um, items of housekeeping. Since the agenda was published, we've received one more letter of objection from local resident and it's been requested by highways that we include an informative in the recommendation regarding seeking highways consent for the new access uh, that was missed off previously but um, it's an informative rather than a planning condition so just to make the committee aware of that so 10 chestnut avenue members may or may not be aware but this application is the third application um, in an attempt by the applicant to secure permission for a new dwelling at the site. Uh, the previous two applications were refused under delegated powers, um, but uh, similar concerns were raised with the previous applications and by the same councillors who called in the application. So this proposal seeks permission for a three-bed, two-storey dwelling uh, to be attached to 10 Chestnut Avenue. This is an aerial of the site, for those who might not be familiar. Floor plan of the existing property. So there was formerly a garage to the side of the site here. That's now been demolished. The area hatched in blue at the, at the, to the rear of the existing dwelling denotes the area of extensions that, and alterations that have been permitted or consented at the property, some of which are underway now. 
So that's the existing ground floor and the existing first floor of the property. Um, and you can see to the right there is number eight Chestnut Avenue and to the left, the other half of the semi-detached pair is number 12. And the, the existing roof plan showing a hip to gable loft conversion that has consent separately, but is also included within this application for completeness, given that it all physically connects. The existing elevations of the immediate street scene in front of you there, front and rear of the property. And some side elevations showing what the alterations to the existing dwelling um, might look like in terms of their mass and scale, if fully, fully built out. Moving on to the proposal, the proposal seeks, as I said earlier, at an attached three-bed, two-storey dwelling um, with some small alterations to the previously approved schemes for the extensions to the existing property at number 10 and a porch to the front and some outbuildings that I'll come on to later. <coughs> And this is the proposed first floor, showing the layout of the bedrooms. As you can see, it's a very similar depth to uh, neighbouring properties generally. And the proposed roof plan of the attached dwelling. This is an elevation of the proposal showing the front and rear of the proposed property. As you can see, it closely mirrors the other half of the semi-detached pair. And if I might at this point, I'll, because I know this is likely to come up in terms of the discussion and debate by members, I included the elevations and floor plan of the most recent refusal, uh, which was refused in October, which I'll come on to, um, which to show the comparison between the two dwellings. Um, the refusal of that um, previous application has been uh, lodged for appeal. Now, if I just scoot down to that. So... This is, this is an elevation of the previous refusal, showing the street scene. So previously, a detached three-bedroom property was proposed with a very similar roof plan and overall footprint. Um, the difference between it is purely down to the design details of the front elevation and roof design of that property and the fact, the fact that it now physically attaches to the existing property. So if I can just show you the street scene here, hopefully you can make that out. Um, it better reflects the other half of the semi-detached pair. And I'll go up to a larger version of it here so you can see more clearly that um, the detailed design, even down to the inclusion of the porch and the window casements and bay windows, is very similar to the other half of the semi-detached pair. There's greater separation from the uh, dwelling to number eight, the non-adjoining neighbour. And um, as a result, the design details of the proposed dwelling are now considered to be acceptable and have overcome the previous concerns raised. Um, some elevations of the proposed dwelling. No windows are proposed in the flank. Again, that's the roof plan proposed. The previous refusal. Part of the application includes outbuildings to the rear of the site to serve each of the resulting two properties. These are very basically designed um, outbuildings um, to the rear of the property, built as one property, but each serving one, each, one serving each property. And um, their footprint would be relatively large in isolation, but given the size of the plot and the size of outbuildings generally in the location, it, it wouldn't be considered to be untoward at all. Um, the indicated use of the outbuildings is that of a gym and playroom for each property. This gives an indication here of the, the site, the proposed site layout, which shows the outbuildings towards the rear. The hatched area is the footprint of the attached property. There's an existing vehicle access that serves the site that would have led to the garage previously. That would be slightly tweaked with respect to its location and a second vehicle access is proposed to the far left of the, pl of the plot um, so that each property would have its own vehicle access providing off-street parking on the frontage. There's another proposed site layout showing some <coughs> vehicle access and um, uh, swept path analysis and um, the context of 
the outbuildings at the rear. And some images of the street scene. I grabbed an image from Google Street View because it actually shows the garage when it was still in situ and it shows the lamp com column um, just outside of the site. This has been raised um, by the ward councillor as a concern in that there was a question over as to whether the new vehicle access, which is proposed to the far left of the site, would be able to be constructed in accordance with our vehicle crossover policy, given the siting of that column. There are no concerns about that, and the vehicle crossover team have no objections to the proposed new vehicle access. But um, in particular, I wanted to show the property as it, as it looked prior to the removal of the garage and the hoardings that have now gone up on site. So... This is how it looks uh, more recently. So the property is on the right with the scaffolding, and you can see um, the non-attached neighbour number eight there on the left and the other half of the semi. And here is the front and rear of the property. So you've got the application site in the left-hand image taken from Chestnut Avenue and from the rear of the garden there behind where you can see the works have commenced on the approved extensions. And further images of the rear. Um, you can see number eight is built relatively close to the party boundary between both properties. The first floor window you can see in the flank there is a bathroom window, I believe, and, um, and you can see the works being undertaken at the back of number 10. Some more images of the neighbouring site. And looking down the garden, um, you can see the location of where the outbuilding would be proposed in each, in each plot, and these photos, while they're not obviously seamless, they show the extent of the width of the rear of the site, and you can see where some initial groundworks were, were commenced, including a trench dug for utilities. Um, works, uh, the applicant has confirmed that those works have ceased um, until the determination of this application, um, which is recommended favourably tonight. So... In summary, um, the revised proposals are considered to overcome the previous concerns raised regarding the appearance of the dwelling, the potential overdevelopment of the site and the impact upon the character and appearance of the area. The development is acceptable with, with regards to its scale and layout and impact upon local and neighbour amenity and highway safety. Um, I'm, I'm appreciative that labour concerns and objections are noted, and I know that there are particular concerns regarding any potential um, larger HMO use of the site. Um, direct discussions have been held with the applicant about this, and they have absolutely denied that the scheme would be a larger HMO. And um, whilst we have been, consi been considering an application for a single C3 dwelling, which has been submitted, as before members tonight, we have considered it appropriate to include within the recommendation um, with, for, for approval conditions restricting and limiting the use of the dwellings under condition three. So both the existing dwelling at number 10 and the new property shall only be used for class C3 purposes as single dwelling houses and not as a larger HMO. And we've also included a condition under condition 11 restricting the permitted development rights for any further extensions or outbuildings to the property to control the development as far as we're physically able to, to give um, residents as much comfort as we can in regard to the C3 use of the site. Um, I'm aware that those, those concerns regarding character impact remain, but given given the changes made to the proposal with particular regard to its appearance and the fact that it would so closely mirror that of the other half of the semi-detached pair it's con and it's moved further away from number eight, the non-adjoining neighbour, it's considered that a recommendation to refuse for the re reasons previously wouldn't be upheld as appeal. So um, if, uh, for members tonight, it is recommended um, for approval. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're just going to try something slightly uh, this, different this evening as per recent recommendations from the PAS review. We're going to invite speaker statements down straight away. And then once they're done, we go straight into questions and uh, debate, okay? Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, invite a statement of objection that's been received from Councillor Hooper, who's ward member. And that statement can be found on pages four to five of the speaker booklet. If you'd like to come down, uh, Councillor, and uh, you have roughly three minutes uh, in which to present your case. Thank you.
Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? <clears throat> and I'll begin. <clears throat> right, this is the third planning application in nine months. The previous applications were rejected due to the overdevelopment of the land of 10 Chestnut Avenue. The new plans don't change that very much. The two previous applications for additional detached dwellings have re were refused fundamentally by the subdivision plot were considered by the council to be too narrow, leading to the site appearing overdeveloped and poorly related to the wider plots in character of the rest of Chestnut Avenue. <coughs> the new application, uh, the proposal for an attach, is attached to number 10, making this a three terrace block. Number 10 is attached to number 12, all houses in Chestnut Avenue are detached or semi-detached. This creates a terrace which is not in keeping with the housing in the avenue. In fact, number 12 could lose property value as a, re a result of planning permission being agreed. The layout <coughs> and dimensions of the proposed new dwelling is based on the same previous refused application. Um, the site is still n appears narrow and overdeveloped. I would also like to highlight that uh, the previous application went up to the boundary line. Yes, it has moved over slightly, but it actually s will stop or reduce lighting into that bathroom at number eight. Parking, the block plan shows uh, off-street parking for two vehicles. One seems to be much smaller than the standard planning size. I guess if you buy cars from Toys R Us, you'll be fine. The additional two space application shows that number 10 uh, uh, parking bound, it goes right up to the boundaries. No space to open doors or public uh, pedestrian access. <coughs> the plan also fails to show the entrance to the porch um, into the parking area and no space to place bins as there's no access to the rear. As for the drop curb, I'm concerned that the drop curb, as highlighted earlier, outside the property uh, is not well placed and moving the light would create a concern around road safety. <coughs> road safety, the road is a really busy road. Um, uh, with the development of the uh, diagnostic centre in Lodge Lane planned to open in 2025 and Saturday is really difficult in parking as there's a church 100 metres away and parking can be extremely dangerous. Adding more housing to this area will just make the parking more challenging. As for the gym, the, the gym seems to be very large and uh, not in keeping uh, in terms of a family home. There doesn't seem to be any services for toilets, showers or drains um, uh, or electrical appliances going into the building. And as you could see early, in earlier pictures, the developers already dug trenches running to the gym. Residents are concerned that the, these properties would be used for uh, HMSOs as places where people live. The design of the properties also, uh, of number 10 and the, and the new property at number 10, seems to be designed in such a way that it suits an MHO rather than a family home. I'm concerned about the way the developer has conducted itself, and particularly in the way it's taken, over, taken up fencing and damaged property at number 8 and number 12, uh, particularly where I'm concerned about the vulnerability of people in their mid-70s and 90s who live at number 12. So, in conclusion, uh, I would ask the committee to refuse this planning on the basis that the site is overdeveloped, reduce access to lights number eight, inadequate parking, road safety, um, and we have major concerns around it being an HMO and not a family home. Please refuse this application. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Hooper. Okay, thanks for that, and uh, you may, uh, may return, thank you. Um, and we do have another speaker statement. This is a statement of uh, support, and this has been received from Ajay Hirani, 
Uh, the statement can be found on page six of the speaker's booklet. Um, please come down, Mr. Harani. You've got uh, roughly three minutes to uh, present your case. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I um, would like to address the few objections which have been raised. Um, with regard to the parking, we have submitted a parking study which makes it clear that the parking is not an issue on the street. Um, this, has been, this has been supported by the highways officer as well, um, well, highways team. Regarding uh, the property itself, um, many of the, the street is very vast. The streetscape is very different along this road. Um, as, you, as you may be aware, 164 Long Lane, number 70 Chestnut Avenue, and 136 Long Lane have also been recently submitted applications for a very different design compared to ours. We're matching the neighboring, keeping the street look, um, keeping up, and there's no overlooking issues other than the same as which the existing situation is. I'd like to make it clear that number 12 is two dwellings. So our property is now considered a end of terrace. So it's the same situation what we're doing. We're extending our terrace. So number 12 has got 12 and number 12A established to it. Um, you can see that on Royal Mail documentation on that side of it. Um, also the enforcement also, the enforcement, with regards to the enforcement, we have been told by the planning department to show the outbuilding on the design, even though it falls under permitted development. It's all under PD rights. We have been advised by the planning officer to show it in the design so we, it alleviates any further extensions to be added to the development, which we're happy, my clients are happy to propose on the, on the site. Sorry. With regards to antisocial behavior, um, this has been demonstrated on the street by the member of publics, by the vandalism to the hoardings and our site so far. We want to alleviate this by giving a secure by design, which has also been supported by the local authority um, in re reflections to this. In regards to, sorry, um, Um, Thank you, sir. Thank you. If, if you could have these few minutes and we'll, um, I'd like to we'll come back make it clear Thank I'm you. the architect for the job. I'm only representing my clients here at the end of the day. Um, sorry, that's where I was on that one. Parking, the inf anti social the enforcement has now, we are complying to all enforcement matters. Um, with regard to the outbuilding, I believe everything has been addressed. Yes, there will be waste going out of the building. So there has been a trench dug out, but again, we are falling within permitted development rights and everything has been explained on, on that side of it. So having a, everything addressed on that side of it. So if there is any other questions, we have to deal with it, but the conditions which have been put forward for the HMO has made it clear that there is no HMO on the site. I don't know where this has come from. People in the area have just established this in the area. There's no HMO being proposed or determined on our site. And we're happy with the conditions that have been put on to stop this further stuff from happening as well. Thank you very much for your time on this one. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, statement there. I'll go back, thank you. <coughs> okay, right, so now what we're going to do is going to move on to questions to the officer. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see... Well, Thank you. Yep, we've. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank, thank you, sir. I've, we've got. We've got what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. Up, down. Yep. From their opinion, your opinion. I've got it. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll go over to questions now. Councillor Watson, then Councillor Arnold. Thank, Thank you, Councillor Thank Byrne. you, Chair. Um, can you just pull up some of those um, drawings for me? Because our, our screens aren't working here. So 
Am I right that there is one doorway to both, just the one doorway, then then inside it splits into two properties? If I may, Chair, I'll just get to that relevant drawing on the ground floor plan as proposed. Give me a second. There. So, can you... Sorry. I'm not, I'm not known to have a quiet voice, so apologies. Um, so, I've just pulled up the proposed ground floor drawing there. So, you can see, um, Chair, the proposed front porch. It would have two doorways in, within the porch. The first being there at the sort of fronting the driveway to the existing property and the second entrance to the side for the new property. And in the elevations, you can see... go the right way in a moment there so you can see the doorway there in the top image to the side of the porch going into the proposed new property and there in the top image the doorway going into the existing there can you see I don't know if I can if I zoom in further I don't know what it's going to actually do to the image so at the top you've got a front so you've got a porch with one entrance there, you know, where my mouse is, hopefully that. Yep, there. And then one in the flank, yeah. Um, can I just ask, what is the distance between the end of that new terrace to that boundary line, or is it actually on the boundary line? Are you asking with respect to the distance from the flank of the new dwelling to the boundary between there and number eight? It's around about a metre to the boundary. It's not on the boundary. A metre. So three foot, three inches, yeah. 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 So between the, the two flank, it's about two metres because it's, it's just slightly over that. Yeah. Sorry. So... Can I just ask, also, is the garden half down? If, if you're asking if the garden is subdivided, yep, it's... If I go down to one of the later images that more clearly shows the, the proposal, I'll zoom in here so you can see it more clearly on the, the larger screen. It, the proposal seeks to subdivide the plot lengthways and, and you can see there's... Uh, bicycle uh, cycle storage and bin storage proposed in the rear garden of the new property, but it would be subdivided with 1.8 metre higher fencing. So in terms of the, in terms of the actual avenue itself, um, I go down there quite a bit, and to be frank with you, it is full of traffic every time I go down there both sides. Yeah. So what is the impact of additional traffic that's going to be there? And I'm sorry, I've got cramps. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. If I may, um, if I no, if I if I may, I'm I'm familiar with Chestnut Avenue, and I've dealt with many applications over the years along there, and I'm familiar with some of the other uses that aren't residential that cause concerns regarding parking and tra traffic generation. Um, but with, re with respect to this particular proposal, it would provide adequate parking in line with policy PMD8 for both, dwell for both dwellings. And there would be no reason to, or no justifiable reason to recommend refusal on parking grounds or due to highway harm. Um, it, it just wouldn't stack up at appeal in my opinion. So, so the other thing that the applicant has said is to be honest, I'm, I'm not going to look at like the similar developments in Long Lane or Lodge Lane or anything like that. It's in Ch Chesson Avenue itself. So is 70 Chesson Avenue, if you've gone down and had a look, is that like terraced houses to make it a terrace or not? Chair, if I may, no, it isn't a terrace property. The, those properties referred to by the speaker, the um, agent in relation to the application, referred to more modern schemes that have been submitted and larger extensions to properties and, and, and the like. It's uh, to highlight that other um, similar scale development has been, has been allowed elsewhere or modern schemes have been allowed elsewhere. Um, 
the fact that this would be result in an end terrace effectively, no matter what the debate you may have over number 12, is different for the avenue. However, the fact that it so mirrors the other half of the semi, it makes it really difficult from a planning perspective to raise any substantial objection to that. Um, just there in particular, it's if, if I'd written this up for refusal on the basis of design and character impact, we could easily go down for costs in my view. My, this is my professional opinion, not that of the authority. I think because it so mirrors it, it would be really difficult for us to defend a refusal on those grounds. Can you bring up the front picture of, that, of the house for us, please, Nadi? Chair, the, 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 the photograph, the site yes, image, please. yeah, sure. So that's the image from Street View, which probably shows it more clearly without the hoarding. So has it got a drop curb already? Yep. Or are they or will it need an additional drop curb next to it for the uh, two houses? Yes, on both counts. There's an existing vehicle access on the right hand side there that served serves the property and the driveway. And to the far left of the plot, there will be a new vehicle access, a second one created that will be clear of the lamp column and would be acceptable in vehicle crossover. Uh, policy terms. So yes, there will be two. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to take out another chunk of pavement or for anybody to park along there then, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it would do, but it would also provide uh, off-street parking for both properties. So that's a balance that has to be struck. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, yeah, no, all right. So I've got a couple of names there. I'll move on from yourself, Councillor Watson. First is Councillor Arnold, then, then Councillor Byrne. Um, and then on to Councillor Redso on Polly. So, Councillor Arnold, next, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nadia. Um, Councillor Watson actually uh, raised a point that instantly came to my mind, um, and that is obviously regarding the front door. Uh, I'm aware of another planning application in the borough some couple of years ago, which maybe threw up the same um, concerns. Um, and, and it actually, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it has been designed in a way that it actually mirrors it perfectly. And to all intents and purposes, with that design of front porch, it actually looks like one house. Now, that that is a major concern for me um, from a design point of view. <clears throat> that leads on to, obviously there's been much discussion about this being turned into a, a multiple dwelling. Um, are there any stipulations or are there any controls with, with regards an application such as this where it can be said that all internal walls must remain intact? Um, it cannot be knocked into one. Um, I think, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm gonna, I think I'm saying this is most people's fears. It's the instant conclusion people would think. So I would really like to see action taken where that, that property, both properties, cannot be linked internally. Chair, if I may, um, from a planning perspective, we, we may well find it very difficult to impose a condition restricting internal wall separation or gaps, say, being created, and that condition meeting the six tests of planning. But we have imposed conditions restricting permitted development full stop for both properties. So that would include things like the insertion of doorways, other doorways or openings externally, but we are limited in terms of what we can control internally. But the condition regarding the restriction to, but for both properties being used for C3 single dwelling houses means that they can only be used for that purpose. And that means they should be occupied as in on family for no more than six persons living in each property, say. That would not, I should point out, prevent them being used as smaller HMOs as it would enable any C3 dwelling to be used as such, but it would prevent larger HMO use being used for either property. Um, and that, that is as much comfort we can give from a planning perspective. Um, I'm looking at uh, looking at worst case scenario, following on from your su suggestion, your your question, um, Councillor Arnold, I'd say that if if say the properties were combined to be used as a larger HMO, 
we would then have the ability to take enforcement action um, seeking, uh, seeking a breach of condition notices because they would have breached those conditions within the permission. Um, and of course, separate to that, there is other legislation that's separate to planning regarding housing, re relevant housing licenses that would be required. But from a planning point of view, uh, we've gone as far as we can to reasonably control the proposals. Thank you, Nadia. I mean, you've explained that very well. Um, it doesn't actually satisfy my line of thinking, if I'm being really, really honest. Yeah. Um, but I won't go on about that too much further. I think I'll save any further comments to the uh, to further further uh, after the questions. Thank you. Okay, we've got quite a lot of hands up, so uh, we'll go on to Councillor Byrne, then Councillor Redsell, Polly, and Piccolo. So over to Councillor Byrne. Thank you. Hi. Um, bills like this give me more casework than bins. It's always during the build, do we take into account where the builders' vans are parked, the diggers, the concrete lorries, the on-road dis disruption during the rush hour? Do we all these concrete lorries in and out and stopping people going in and out? There's always complaints, all, and we don't handle that very well at all. We got them down Branksome Avenue, which is I get complaints every single day. Are there? Are, do we take into account building noise? Restrictions on working hours, weekend working, etc. Is do we is that actually taken into account on planning, and and how do we overcome or not overcome these issues? Hi, thank you, Chair. If I may, um, Councillor Byrne and I are well versed on what's going on down Branksome Avenue, and in regard to um, this particular application, we have absolutely considered the the management of the construction of the development and condition four addresses that and requires a construction management plan um, that is detailed to be submitted and agreed and indeed there is a um, an hours of work condition under condition nine as well so in answer to that um, chair is yes we do okay thank you uh, moving on to uh, councillor redsell thank you thank you chair very much thank you steve for um what you're talking about um just a couple of questions really um Councillor Arnold mentioned just now, we know that, that, you know, most of the people sitting in this audience know that there's HMOs going on around the borough and a great many of them, probably too many of them, are coming into play at the moment. And I'm in the same vein, I can see this becoming a HMO. Whether we like it or not, I think that's what's going to happen. And it, it's, it's when you see something like this, especially with two front doors as well, that gives you another thought to what could happen. Um, I think in my ward alone, I'm looking at every property now that goes up for sale becoming an HMO. So I'm looking at it. If there's six people or living in both properties, we're talking about 12 cars. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to look to, to people have two cars per whatever. So... Um, and I've, I, like Councillor Byrne, I've had in my ward um, really trouble from HMOs. They don't really sit in with the keeping of the street. It becomes terrifying to some people. Um, my other question is, why didn't we stop the developer doing what they were doing, as digging holes in the back garden, putting concrete in, putting pipes through? To Where are they putting pipes through? I've had it in Laird Avenue, um, where we've had two bungalows move together, and it, it's, it happens, you know, and enforcement, as we've only got one enforcement officer at the moment going around checking Thurrock, it's a big job for him. Um, so I can see, I just really want to know why enforcement didn't get to it earlier, when, why is he running pipes to the outbuildings out the back when it's just a gym, you know, so if you can just answer those, and I'll ask my other questions later on. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Redsell. I'll take each of these in turn if I can. So, the, with respect to the concerns raised in regarding to possible HMO use and, um, and then separately the, the issues of cars on top of that, um, 
as a planning department, we can only deal with the application before us, which specifically states it's for a C3 dwelling and would result in two C3 dwellings. Indeed, we've, we've gone back to the applicant and asked that question, given the local concerns raised, and the explicit response has been, these will not be HMOs, it will not be a larger HMO use. So we cannot go beyond the realms of planning in that regard. We can deal with what's in front of us. Um, and two family homes can generate one car or four cars each. We, we all face that situation. Um, the fact that both dwellings would provide adequate car parking in line with council adopted car parking policy, we can't, go, we can't be seeking any more than that and certainly couldn't refuse it for that reason with any expectation we'd uphold it on parking or highway grounds. Um, and, it, and it's interesting your, your comment regarding um, perceptions of HMOs. Um, I've, I recently, ref, well, last year I refused a larger HMO use at a site in the borough where it, it already had the site, a, a normal family property had been extended, and if you just indulge me for a moment, and they had a license for nine occupants and the property had been extended as a, household pro as a householder property. Um, and we got them to submit a larger HMO application. We did consider lots of different concerns at, with that property. That property provided no off-street park, car parking at all, none. And it was in a busier part of the borough than Chestnut Avenue. It wasn't in Grace, but it was in a much busier part. And there were other concerns, neighbour amenity impact concerns. And I recommended refusal on that for five reasons. Um, and I thought that's got to be a solid refusal. It went to appeal and it was dismissed as appeal. And the planning inspector, and this was only a couple of months ago, said, doesn't seem to be that bad with respect to lack of parking. And um, the impact is generally... Oh, sorry, my apologies. It was allowed on appeal. That's what I was meant to say. It was allowed on a, It was allowed at appeal. Um, and they didn't... Con the inspectorate did not consider there to be any concerns about the lack of parking because there was capacity on street. They didn't consider the impact on neighbour amenity to be significant. And one of the reasons was on character impact and the fact that the change from a C3 dwelling to a larger HMO imp impacted the character of the street scene for reasons that you're implying. And the council was not supported in that by the planning inspectorate. So I'm, I'm also mindful of that. Not that that's relevant to this particular application, but generally that larger HMO concern um, we've not had supported at appeal very recently. Um, so that's what I wanted to comment with respect to your concerns about larger HMOs. You also mentioned the enforcement, the matter of enforcement and what they've done on site in terms of digging. I think with respect to this, spe this specific site and the breach that was raised regarding the digging of foundations for an outbuilding, the, the agent is correct in that digging to create an outbuilding under Class E of the GPDO could be carried out to a single dwelling house if it's going to be an ancillary use. However, the proposal before us was to a full application to subdivide to create a separate dwelling. So my view is that there is no PD status for an outbuilding under Class E in relation to the subdivision of the plot and what we're looking at, given the fact it forms part of the application, which is why we, we insisted that it was included within the application, both outbuildings, because permission is required for that. It's not a PD matter. Um, if subsequent to this application being determined, whichever happens, and say, for example, there is no dwelling built there, the, the owner of the property wants to put up a, an outbuilding of a similar footprint that's less than two and a half metres in height and is used for ancillary purposes, they could do that without the need to submit a planning application, but they can't do it showing it's subdivided and for a separate use, because that does require permission. So um, unfortunately, the agent was wrong in that regard. In terms of the planning breach, we can only take action where there is clearly a breach. We went out on site, we saw them digging, the enforcement officer told them to stop, they stopped. There will be no point in taking enforcement action if nothing else has been done. Them digging a trench does does not actually help their case particularly, particularly given the local concerns raised, 
but at the moment there is no there is no real justifiable or expedient reason to take enforcement action and finally yeah we definitely need more enforcement officers and that was raised in the PAS review and uh, we were, I'd welcome that and we are looking to remedy that as we speak can I come back chair quickly thank you very much um, I understand your dilemma on and and in the enforcement I will be pushing to help there um, but I think um, with HMOs, the applicant can do all they like and say this is not going to be an HMO, but watch this space. You know, we know I've got it in my ward, never had HMOs before, and we've got them now. And it's every, sometimes houses that just come up are big enough to make into an HMO, and we seem to be getting that. Um, it's sort of coming in from London bound, you know, they see the houses up for sale and, and they use them as an HMO. So, and they... They don't all, it'd be nice if, if an HMO came into the area and it made the area better, but it doesn't. It adds um, antisocial behaviour, it does. Because in my ward I've had it, so I, I've gone through it, so I know um, what that implies. So just thank you for that, Nadia, but I'll wait for questions for later on. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so we're going to then go on to Councillor Polly, then Councillor Piccolo, and then further questions. So please raise your hand if you want to speak again. Uh, Councillor Polly, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Nadia, just looking on the planning history there, we had application 23484, 231125, and this application 231357. On, one, on 484, we, we stipulated, as most planning applications do, bedrooms, because that's the way sort of English people tend to do it. On the continent, you say how many square foot per property or so. So we normally denote a, an application by bedroom. The next two, the 1125 and the 137, actually make comment on how many people would live in the house. I think that's really unusual. I, I've, I'm not familiar with many applications that actually say this is a three-bedroomed three -bedroomed property with five people living in it or four bedrooms with six people living in it. Is, am I right? Is that unusual for that? If I may, Chair, it's not, not hugely uncommon these days, uh, particularly with the nationally described space standards regarding bedrooms and number of occupants. Um, and I think in particular with this site, because the initial application um, looked like it had a lot, a lot, a higher number of persons that could be occupying it in the very first application that's when we sought that clarification from the applicant and that is why um, we have stipulated the bedrooms and indeed the applicant did on subsequent applications in terms of bedrooms and number of occupants for those concerns raised I, I just feel how How can planning control the amount of people that live in the house? I find that a bit of a... Uh, it doesn't... I, I don't quite understand how we could say to a couple, you can't have a baby. I don't, I don't quite understand that. The, the other thing is, we, you've, you've spoke, and we, you know, we have to... Planning is always emotive, and we have this recurring uh, planning. We have to focus, as you've many of your officers and quite rightly so have to focus in on what is planning considerations the ifs buts and maybes we have to keep it factual um, as so on on the conditions that we're saying about it being two c3 properties that it we it, it, the classification can't be changed without uh, further applications being submitted as, as you quite rightly say hmos are an animal of their own they they, they are subject to very serious um, licensing and requirements and they have to have light in wind they have to have rooms with light access they have to have fire doors they have to do they, they, it's a very detailed and extensive process they have to go to um, it, within this application, we've made quite a lot of conditions to, to ensure as best we can that they stay as two C3 properties. If, if the ownership of those 
properties changed? Are the new owners subject to the same planning conditions as we're implementing now? Thank you. Yes, Chair, they will be. They, they would go with the land and it's flagged up also in relation to the permitted development like status as well and restrictions. So both the use and the PD limitations would be flagged up on any land searches um, if, the sale, if a sale was to happen and they would continue with the site. Okay, thank you. And then going on to Councillor Piccolo. Thank you, Chair. Just a little bit of clarification. There's no restriction on putting external doors on, ex external doors in. The concern that I'm hearing here is whether or not they link the two buildings by putting an internal door in. But technically, if they're both separate properties, whilst a linked door would technically be internal, in actual fact, it would be external to one property leading into another property. Am I, am I making it, well, you know, <laughs> I know it, it sounds strange, but it's, I'm, I'm just saying, you wouldn't, someone couldn't just knock a hole in the wall. If it was owned by two separate people, someone couldn't just knock a hole in the wall and say, oh, well, I'm getting out through your door now. If, if, I'm, if I may, Chair, any, any external opening that would normally be um, allowed under permitted development would require a planning application for either property if the, this application is approved. But um, so the, to the heart of the matter, I would consider in terms of what Councillor Piccolo is referring to, with the, if there is an, in, an internal door created that would create a physical link internally between the two dwellings, what would lead on from that would be a material change of use from two C3 dwelling houses to use as a larger HMO, and it is that which we would take action upon rather than the physical opening. That would be my, that would be my take on it. Um, I've never been asked before whether an internal doorway that's physically on an end wall, which is still a, a party wall, is an external opening. I suspect it wouldn't be. I don't know whether a, a legal advisor would have any further guidance on that. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I was just looking at the TCPA while, while you were speaking, trying to work um, that out. Um, it's not clear whether that would be development because as you'll be aware, section 55 um, has various exclusions of what is development and one of the things is internal works. The definition of building is building or any part of a building. Um, and so I genuinely think I'm, I, I, that may have been determined in case law. I'm not aware of it currently. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's clear. Um, but the, the, the way of resolving it would be to deal with the material change of use. Um, interesting question, though. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions? Not for the moment. Okay, right. So I did have a couple. Uh, Nadia, I just wanted to check... Um, Oh, notes. The previous history, so refused in 2023, refused in 2023. My understanding is you can't submit a third application within two years of the first refusal, which was on the 5th and 9th, 2023. So why am I looking at a third application? Thank you. Chair, Chair that's correct if they're of the same character or description and they're not, unfortunately. Okay. Any further questions? Councillor Byrne. Is that actually not, or is that splitting ears? I don't know. These people are um, up in arms, so is it? Chair, if I may, um, it's, I don't think it, I wouldn't agree that it's a case of, of uh, splitting hairs. It's, it's a clear assessment and the, the council would be asked to consider whether we would want to consider that, say, a third application. In this case, because of the changes made, where previously you had detached dwellings, and this is an attached dwelling that is of a different description and character, um, we, we, it, we would find it very hard to push back at the applicant at that stage, at this, at the third application, and say, 
actually we would refuse to decline, we'd, we'd decline to determine this application under the Act. It would be very difficult for us to do. So I actually would consider, you know, in this case that we've done the right thing in terms of process and assessing under character and description basis. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions? Okay, right, so with that, we'll now go to the uh, debate phase where we can uh, express our opinions as to what we think and whether we should be giving this one the green light or not. Um, who would like to start? Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to just come straight out with it, really. I'm not going to support this recommendation. Um, I might be going out on a limb, and, and I do understand the technical reasons why that may be a dangerous thing to do. Um, but I would just give my my opinion would say it's poor design. Um, my own own opinion is that there is an attempt to make this property look as one. If the drawing showed clearly a second front entrance, I could change my mind. But at the minute, I won't be supporting. Thank you. Okay, I'll go over to Councillor Watson and Councillor Redsell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not going to support this application. Um, the reason being is that I, I do really think that it is that character for the rest of the street. Um, and I also have concerns about the parking down there. That is, um, for me, um, will be an issue. Um, about the HMO staff, that's not consideration here, but you can't guarantee that. Nobody can. And so... I just think for the reason of being that it just looks like I know you're saying there's a door at the side, but actually anything could happen and it can it can you can take that door down and you can have just one house and it you can do a C three means HMO as well, whatever. So you you can't even guarantee that either. So therefore I'm not going to accept this proposal and I'm going to refuse it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, over to Councillor Redsell, then Councillor Piccolo. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm of the same feeling. I think parking out of character, HMO, we, we can't know. If they, if they were to join these two houses inside, we would never know, unless somebody reported it as being. But nobody's going to know what you do inside that property. And having seen many of these go to HMOs, I can't support this in any way, shape or form. I think it's um, it's an HMO waiting to happen. You know, I can see it, having seen so many of them. And I just think that it is out of character in, in the street, knowing Chestnut Avenue as I do. Um, it's just out of my ward. So um, having lived there a long time, I know the character of the area. And I think it is really... And parking, I would think, if, if it's two properties, it is going to be a lot of cars. It is going to cause a problem on that road. You know, people keep saying it's a very... I think sometimes, Nadia, it's how we take the pictures of the road and we look down it, and it isn't a wide road. Not really. Um, it's, it has the hospital at one end. It has St John's Church over the other side. So it, it, it does cause a lot of problems at certain times of the day. So thank you very much. OK, thank you, Right, There was a few more hands up there. So I'm going to go to Councillor Shinnick, then Lydiard. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I won't be uh, supporting this because I live in that area. I go down that uh, road on a Sunday and it's a nightmare for cars. You know, it's terrible parking. And for me, it's a no-brainer. I'm not voting for it. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was going to go to Councillor Piccolo, then Councillor Lydiard. Sorry, Councillor Lydiard. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to uh, disappoint the residents um, and, also, and also the other members that have spoken so far of the planning <laughs> committee because um, just purely looking at it, you can't look at a planning application and decide it on assumptions. You can't assume that something might happen in the future. You have to look at what is detailed in front of you at the time. Um, and I would feel that I would be doing a disservice if I was to look at every planning application to say, well, actually, do, is this actually what they mean? You know, am I second guessing what might happen? So 
as everything else is in alignment with plan in law um, and is approved, uh, um, is, is recommended for approval, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to go with that. Um, I'm, I'm not prepared to make assumptions on what might happen. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Piccolo. Uh, over to Councillor Lydiard. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I think we've looked at all the objections and um, quite honestly, they don't amount to justifiable reasons for refusal. Maybe apart from design, but then, you know, if, if, if one side mirrors the other side, it, it's going to look quite good and I'm, I'm going for approval. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Byrne. Yes, I'm having to agree with the last two comments. I would like to see it defined as two front doors, but that's my only objection, but I can't see how we can not vote in with the advice we've been given. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Polly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, while the officer was giving the... Um, presentation of the report we were reminded that we have got a live um, appeal outstanding as well and if you look at that application against this application I would say uh, this this is the better option uh, if if we it would be unlikely if on appeal if the other application was allowed that they would not continue with this one. But if we're refusing this one against officer recommendation and the other application is successful on appeal, uh, the, the residents may um, be worse off than, than this particular um, application. Or the, we do need to focus on the, the planning uh, the planning reasons. Thank you. Not a planning consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, okay? You don't know how the vote's going, okay? So you're not we helping yourself debating. right now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, and again, I would support what Councillor Piccolo said. We, we really do as have... We, even our training, our last lot of planning yeah. training brought in the, um, the KC that delivered that training did explain to us about perceived fears uh, that that as emotive as the as emotive as applications can be we we are guided to bring it back in with we are a quasi judicial committee and we have to work within the framework of those rules and regulations so thank you chair okay thank you everyone thank you for your contributions there um right i think i've heard from everyone uh so so we will come to some form of conclusion um, no you're happy yeah um yeah so it is a real tough one i think looking at it from both sides uh on one side obviously the developer has clearly uh, overcome what what they were required to overcome uh, according to the professional uh, advice that we received uh, this issue with hmos is a, is a bad one unfortunately we've had this in oval gardens where developers turn up and no it's not hmo no it's not hmo and then six months later it's a, it's a small hmo um, but again it's it's not something that can be uh, considered under planning so it, it's a tough one. Um, obviously, when you look at the previous reasons for refusal um, set out on pages, uh, there we go. Sorry, two seconds. If you look at the uh, the, the previous reasons of, for refusal on pages 68, um, 
which was why the, the previous schemes were um, refused. Um, the officer's opinion was that uh, uh, by virtue of its narrowness, uh, sub divided plots, excessive widths, etc., the, the opinion was that um, it was a refusal. And are we, what we're looking at now is, I think, a slight improvement, but is it, is it enough of an improvement to come away from that initial consideration? And I think it's subjective, and I think that's really what this comes down to. So I absolutely um, feel that this is an incredibly tough decision. You know, I understand that, you know, we, we, we are right to be concerned at losing it on appeal. Um, so on that basis, uh, obviously we do need to head to a vote. Um, what I'll do is um, I, will, I will allow someone else to uh, put forward the recommendation and see where we end up. Um, that rec move, move recommendation, Councillor Polly. Um, is that seconded? So just, for, just for, to be clear, for the audience as well, what Chair is saying is because the, the committee have, in debate have, have expressed different opinions, I'm going to move in favour of the recommendation for approval. Is that seconded? Seconded by Councillor Lydiard. Those in favour of the recommendation... Have you got that, Jenny? Thank you. Right, so, and those against, sorry, against that. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So that vote was lost for approval. Um, on that basis, I'll offer a second recommendation, which is one of refusal. Uh, is that seconded? Okay, Councillor Shinnick, um, over to yourself, legal. Obviously, are you looking for uh, alternative recommendations for refusal at this stage or head straight to the vote? Need to know, yeah? Chair, Chair if I may, we'd need to know the reasons why yeah, members would you. want to refuse it. Yep, just before we head to the vote there. So, um, Nadia, look, I do obviously really appreciate your opinion. I do think this is a tight one, and it's because it's so tight that I do think that there is a chance against your professional advice that the opinion inspector may look at this differently. Um, on that basis, I would like to recommend refusal on the basis that the development, uh, by virtue of its narrowness and uh, resultant subdivision plots, uh, the excessive width of the proposed dwelling and the close proximity of the new dwelling to the adjacent neighbours led to the site uh, appearing a little bit cramped, um, overdeveloped, um, not quite right in keeping with um, the, uh, the local area, and as such, that will have an impact on the spaces, character and appearance of the immediate street scene. And obviously that is contrary to policies CSTP22, CSTP23 and PMD2 of the adopted Thurkor strategy policies, uh, policies management and development 2015. Um, obviously you could probably pick that up from page 68 that we're generally of the same opinion of the last application. Okay, uh, so with that uh, we will move to the uh, vote uh, for refusal. Uh, with those, is anyone want to add anything else, or are we happy to go with that? Okay, thank you. So, uh, Democratic Socialists, you happy to head to that vote? Thank you. Okay, so all those in favour of refusal, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. And all those against? Okay, it's four. Okay, thank you. So, the vote for refusal has been passed, and as such, the application has been refused. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's a very tight call, that one. There are no right or wrong answers on planning. This is subjective, and uh, we'll see what the future holds for the appeal. Thank you. Okay, sorry, uh, Nadia, just to clarify. Yeah, Chair, just to double-check, I, I take from the wording of the reason for refusal, we're going pretty much as per... The previous, and with your with your agreement now, you're happy to use that same reason for refusal, the exact wording, um, and we don't need to further agree any any other changes to that, given what you've just described and discussed here. Yep, yep. excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Can we just if it, just allow the audience to leave, and then we'll come back. Uh, I was concerned that something different.
Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Piccolo, you got your hand up early. Just wonder if I could ask for some clarification. Yep, certainly. Yeah, just on the, on the last application. Um, sorry, turn, turn your mic up there, Councillor Piccolo. Sorry, on the last application. Um, it's likely, well, I'm not sure that it is, but we've just refused it. They've already got an appeal in, which means they'll probably carry on with the previous application, which we as a committee felt was worse than this one. I don't, I can't, I don't necessarily see that they're going to appeal both, both planning decisions, so we could end up with something that's worse than what, in actual fact, we've just been offered. Chair, if I may, um, just for clarification, the previous refusal that, that an appeal has been lodged against was determined as a delegated item because officers recommended it for refusal. That appeal has been lodged. On the face of it, what I've seen of the appeal, there's no reason why that appeal isn't valid. Um, in terms of the planning inspectorate's considerations, they will determine that in due course. Um, this current application, which has now been refused, that could also be appealed, and we could be, find ourselves in a situation where both appeals are allowed, and then the former development, the previous refusal that was in October, is then carried out on site, or we could end up with one dismissed and one allowed, um, or both dismissed. But, um, yeah, your, your assumption was correct in terms of what could happen, yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, so, um, moving on to the latter part of the agenda, and uh, obviously accepting Councillor Byrne's request earlier on, I'm going to move on to item 11 first, uh, which is uh, land adjacent to 57 to uh, 89 St John's Way, Corringham. Um, Jonathan, can I ask you to present your report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share the presentation. Thank you. So the application before you for St John's Way is located towards the southern part of St John's Way on the built-out area of the pavement here. The application proposes one single totem which would display travel information including bus times um, and other transport information and this would be interspersed with adverts as well. So this is an elevation of the totem on the screen. So it's approximately two meters high, 0.9 meters wide, and 0.2 meters deep. The, that's the application site in front of you. If you can see my cursor on the screen, so it will be just about this side of the salt bin. So it will be built on the sort of built out bit of pavement so it won't cause any obstruction to the highways to pedestrians or vehicles using the the road itself and this is a picture looking back the other way so it'll be just behind where that gentleman is sitting on the salt bin so the application proposes as i said a totem which is designed to provide real-time traffic information for customers and shoppers in the high street um, the application is located in corringham town center and it's a typical type of street furniture that you would see in this sort of location. So in design and character terms, the proposal is considered to be acceptable. The highways officer has been consulted as well and raises no concerns for the location of the um, totem because it's away from points where there would be flow of people or other traffic. Um, just in terms of what the totem is about, so funding was, funding was achieved for a number of totems of this type in 2019 um, which came from money for replacement bus shelter program and that included the real-time information infrastructure and anyone who's been to Graystown Centre or even outside the building will see the ones that are outside the college and in Graystown Centre. Um, it's true that both signs were initially designated to be for stops at the Stanford Railway Station but sort of further analysis of footfall by the installers showed they'd be more effective away from busier areas so therefore if they're in a town centre like Corringham, they would be able to provide more people with information about when the buses and trains would run, so it would be able to support people getting to those bus stops in time. Um, the adverts or the totems will be managed by a media company, but they will follow the council guidelines on the suitability of adverts and content on them, um, and the council will have the final say on what adverts can be located on those totems, so there is scope for the council to ensure that promote, stuff that's promoted on those is suitable to the local area 
and the council will be able to provide adverts or promote its own services such as fostering and those type of adverts. Um, and the maintenance of these will be covered by the Thurrock's share of the advertising revenue, which makes these units cost neutral and any surplus revenue gained will be used for, um, to offset costs of the overall system and other parts of the transport network. So they're cost neutral, they would include adverts that are relevant and suitable to the local area and they're in design terms acceptable and there's no impact on the, the public highway or highway safety. So approval is recommended. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, John. And um, I'd just like to ex uh, extend standing orders, if you don't mind, uh, so we can get through these remaining items on the agenda as it's coming up to 8, well, it's, it's not 8.30 yet, but we've still got a bit of time. Is it, yep, agreed, thank you, excellent, thank you. Okay then, right, that then takes us on to questions. Oh yeah, actually, yeah, we're gonna go statements, aren't we, sorry. Uh, Councillor Byrne, if you could please, uh, as a resident, have you uh, put your statement through? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Byrne. Sorry, Councillor Byrne. Uh, do you want to do, you can do your statement now if you like. Statement now. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Right. Ready. I am speaking on behalf of the traders who requested I speak tonight. The two totems, as I said, were purchased for the railway station. I don't know if it's zero cost because they cost £60,000, £30,000 each, including installation and planning. The totems are not being cited in Corrin because TBC or the Conservatives chose to cite them there. It's the media company because they want footfall. They want to maximise the profits that are, they are sold as bus information balls. Corringham Town doesn't have a bus route. At why they want bus information if there's no buses. The totems are just money-making pods, which does nothing for the small shop, small shop local campaign. Corringham Town still retains its old-school charm. It still has a cobbler's, a fruit and veg store, and many other independent traders like Betty's Bits and Bobs. Many still close on a Wednesday. This totem is not in keeping with the town centre, and that is a material reason to reject. The hub will create interest from those with antisocial behaviour, another point to me, a bike stand where they go out on another drug run, more, more graffiti, the totem will be a base for crime, and that is material. Unless we are 100% sure it will not create crime, you must vote against this on material grounds. I will miss the rest in case I'm doing it, but I've spoken to the Chief Inspector Atkin, is, he has said to me, in regard to the concerns raised, I would ask, ask has, the, has this been highlighted to the council? For any implementation of sign totem or buildings, they should consult the DOCO team. I would ask, has the totem been raised by, with the, DOC, the DOCO team at Essex Police? And the answer to that is no. So the police want you to speak to them and you haven't. So this will, you are hiding or not saying all the material facts because you haven't spoken to the DOCP team, which is recommended by the police. So I don't, I'm worried about having three minutes, but hopefully that's enough. But basically, non-material, places like Specsavers will advertise on this. We have two independent, Opticians, supermarkets who will advertise cheap meat. We have two independent butchers. This is going against, this is designed to take people away from our 10 sand centre and make them go to the supermarkets, make them go to Lakeside, make them go to Basildon. All this will do is put nails in the coffin of Stanford Oak and Corringham. So, and it has gone, the main thing is they've gone totally against a recommendation from our police chief, Aitkin. So, this, on many reasons, is wrong, and we're not putting the material facts to you lot. That it's being covered for some reason, which I don't know why. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Byrne, there for that statement. Um, over to questions. Does anyone have any questions about the totem to the, the officer? Thank you, Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Chair. Um, just for clarity, um, I mean, obviously, you, you made reference to the totems that are just actually just down the bottom there. 
Um, and they, they are very commonplace around the country. Um, I mean, are there, is there any known instances, let's just say greys, of, of it creating or being a hub for antisocial behaviour? Are there any kind of... Um, <laughs> are these centres for antisocial behaviour in short? Thing? I'm not aware of any reports. I don't know if anyone in the highways team has any information on that at all. Matt, Julian? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. I, I haven't heard any, anything in that respect. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Piccolo, then Watson, and then Polly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's going to be any sort of restrictions on who advertises, or what traders advertise on the port. I mean, they're both um, small... Oh, sorry, let's just talk about the Corringham one. It's a, it's a small shopping area. Um, there's a reason, not, not over uh, excessive turnover of shops, but, you know, the, the traders um, do tend to come and go in there. And I'm really concerned that what we're actually going to end up with is an advertising board for shops that aren't in Corringham <laughs> or businesses that aren't in Corringham, which is going to be dissuading the people that are actually visiting Corringham and, and, and suggesting they go elsewhere. The bus stops as well. Yeah, I mean, there's the, the, the transport there. I mean, bus times to the people that go into Corrine, they don't go to Corrine, they catch the bus. Um, so that side of it is going to be, in Corrine, um, is, is, I can't see any benefit to it at all. But I say my biggest concern is, is the damage it could do to the shopkeepers if we get shops outside of Corrine advertising on the board. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Why Corringham? OK, so if I do those in order, if that's OK. So Councillor Piccolo's question was about the adverts, um, and the highways team have advised me that um, they will have the final say on whether the advert or the adverts that can go on the board. So they will be able to to select which adverts can go on and veto ones that they, they don't want to go on there. So that will be within the highways teams, their remit. Um, and I understand from, again, from the highways team, the adverts were designed to be put in this location because there was a higher footfall. And whilst to take the point that it's not directly close to a bus route, that's part of the reason why it was there, because if it provides people with more information about the bus routes that are further away, it gives them more time to plan to get to the bus stop so they could have a longer dwell time in town, going around the shops, and plan to get to the bus in good time, so it would allow them certainly more time to be in the town centre. So it should be seen as, a, in that sense, a positive, positive thing. I think Matt's got some comments as well. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a point of clarification, it's the passenger transport unit that is applied for this application um, in consultation with the highways department. So they, they are the ones that operate um, in conjunction with bus operators. They're the ones that are putting the bus shelters in, the real-time information through this project. So I just want to clarify that with you before you go down a certain way saying it's highways that are putting in, it's actually the passenger transport unit in conjunction with the bus operators and the project. Okay, thank you. Do you want to have one? Yeah, yeah, please. So there's a lot of other spaces in Thurrock that could do with one of these more than Covingham. Outside or Kingdon Station, or, or any station come to that, that will give that sort of level of information. So I'm just really interested why Covingham, when it hasn't really got a bus route going through it, and just because it's got a shopping parade. The second thing I wanted to ask is, like, is there a life expectancy when we've got to put these totems up? Because as Councillor Burnswell, the resident, said, um, this was supposed to go out to Stamford Station. Now, I know Stamford Station is not really a station, but it's still got a train on it. And there is absolutely no reason why it can't go outside Stamford Porter Cabin, can it? Thank you, Chair. Um, there are actually two bus stops at the end of Grover Walk, just at the opposite end where the, 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 the po pod's going to be in Gorium. So literally it's about a minute's walk from the two bus stops. 
So okay. th there are public transport facilities there. So, so still, why Corringham? We've got two totems mm. that we can use. That, I think that's something you'd have to raise with the public transport unit, but they've obviously looked at town centre locations which have a lot of footfall, which we, which we would try to encourage people who use to use public transport and providing that information enables people to visit those places and, and look at real-time information to as and when the buses and give them an opportunity to, to, to actually catch a bus without having to, having to wait a, a, a long period. So, for instance, if it's raining or something, they could potentially take shelter and not have to worry about you know, waiting by the bus stop or whatever it is. So, I mean, we, we could put the question to the public transport unit if you think there are other locations that m might be more acceptable. So, so sorry to labour, labour the point, because like, I don't know, Terry's from Corringham, Councillor Piccolo and Councillor Bar and I'm pretty sure for the last God knows how many years it hasn't had a bus, a, a totem pole there, so they know where they go, but I'm just saying there is more, more heavy footfall places than Corringham, and Stamford Station, Porter Cabin, platform, has got like a great footfall going through it. Ockenden, Bellison and the ward of like Ockenden has got a massive footfall going through it. So I don't, I still don't, I do not think that this, to, this totem is going to be well represented or anything at Corringham. No, no disrespect to any of the residents in Corringham, by the way. Chair, if I may come in on that point. Um, Members have, have been made aware that we've got a couple of totems in Grace that was implemented, um, I think the application came in, in 2019. Um, they've only just recently been electrified because there was a run of issues. Um, that's not to say that there isn't going to be more totems come forward in the future. Um, I think arguably, yes, there is elements of issues around these were originally for Stamford train station, but as we all know, Stamford train station's not necessarily um, the best example of a train station at the moment, as it's been knocked down and we've got a temporary facility. Um, and it's not, it's not um, an issue if, as part of the redevelopment of that train station, that a totem could be put in that location as well. Um, I think the issue around Corringham Town Centre is it is a town centre. It is one of the larger town centres within the borough. Um, and there are bus routes on Gordon Road. And I think there's three main bus routes, two of which are 15-minute services in peak hour. So there's obviously um, a level of demand for those bus services as well. Um, and you would want to put the totems in an area where there is a high footfall to enable people who may be visiting there that are not aware of the timetables to easily find access to it. So, you know, and, and, and looking at the examples of Greys, where we've put the totems in, they have been quite well received, um, and there is evidence to suggest that they are utilised by the people that are using them in the vicinity. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's the member's prerogative whether or not you want to uh, approve this application or not. Um, I have been uh, discussing it with the project lead on it and they and obviously they've said if this is a refusal then they would look to reinvest elsewhere in another location that may suit the bill. So uh, I think that's pretty much all that can be said on that on that point. Okay thank you I'm going to go to Councillor Polly then Red Cell. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, regards to questions, uh, Councillor Byrne might raise the issue about the Design Act crime team from Essex Police. Uh, I, I think we've discussed this before. Do we understand they've only got... Have we got a Design Act crime officer contact that we're aware of? Yeah, for the larger scale applications, we would consult with the Designing Out Crime Officer 
for adverts of this type, that's not something we would usually do. Um, so yeah, on the larger schemes we do and we get responses from them sort of fairly frequently and fairly quickly, yeah. So the, the light emitting totems, is that, and will that, what concerns me, as I've mentioned on previous applications, these these things are very, very bright and very often in the eye line, sight lines of drivers and and imagery, moving imagery. I, I certainly know down at Lakeside Basin, there was a, a sports store there that had one in their window. That as you drove towards it, it was very distracting and quite concerning. I, I mean, do they reduce the light emissions at night or do, does it change at all? Yeah. The Sorry, there are sensors in the advert which will, or sorry, in the totem which will change the light levels depending on the, the time of day. So, yeah, they won't be lit up like Las Vegas at night. Yeah. And the comments from the Highways Authority, certainly they raise no objections to them. So, I think we can hopefully be sure that in terms of Matt's team that there's no, no objections on highway safety in those as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Redsell, then Piccolo. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just um, Councillor Byrne raised quite a good um, argument to why not. I think probably Corringham was the wrong place um, to have it. I know big towns like Lincoln and places like that, they're, they're everywhere, you know, so th and that, that's a good thing because you, it tells you things, what you need to know, but that's bigger towns. And I think probably Corringham is the wrong, to me, I think it's probably down to money um, what these people are making within the advert, so they're going to get their money back on what they're um, taking in um, by putting this, whatever it is, shop, you know, they're going to gain money back from that. So I think, yeah, in my respect, probably Corringham was the worst place they could have put it in that, in that small place, um, and not even Stanford, I wouldn't think, would be the right place for it. But there are other areas where we could have, there are other stations that we could have put it in and there are, most of us sitting here, we could probably name where they could go. So I, j I just really wanted to know, was there any consultation done with residents of Corringham? The, certainly the application came to the planning team for, for the totem in that location. Um, I don't know exactly what, if there was any consultation, but we wouldn't normally be there. Wouldn't normally be separate consultation for for a public information screen of this type, anyway. So it's there's nothing unusual about the way it's come into us, and there's nothing unusual about the recommendation to to recommend a public information screen be approved. Okay, thank you. Uh, over to Councillor Piccolo. <laughs> No. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just a, a couple of things. Um, is there going to be any limit to who can advertise on these boards? Um, in so much as that Corringham's, it's a big town centre for Corringham, but it's not a big town centre as far as, uh, you know, going wider afield. Um, so is there going to be any restriction on, on who can advertise on it? You know, it, could it be, can it be limited to only businesses within a five mile radius, which probably takes in Corringham and Stanford and Lampitz Hill, um, unless it's a unique business? In other words, it's not going to um, be a competitive for one of the businesses that are already existing in Stanford and Corringham? Because I can see how this, if potentially, could actually take trade away from Corringham. Uh, and I know we've got to talk about Stanford later on. But so we just talk about Corring at the moment. So I think if there can be sh some restrictions on who can advertise on it to make sure that it's not detrimental to the local shopkeepers, I haven't got a problem. Yeah, the again, I just clarify the wording I sort of spoke about earlier. The, the pans passenger transport unit said the um, the adverts will follow the council guidelines on suitability of advertiser and content. We have the final say on whether an advert would be suitable. So they will be looking at the adverts that are being promoted to go on there. Um, and I think the idea also is it should try and promote local authority messages, so positive messages about what the authority is doing. As I said, things like adoption, social care, those kind of things should also could also be on there as well. So it's 
it's, a, it's seen by the PTU as a benefit to the community in terms of providing that transport information and sort of wider adverts for the council, but also adverts that have been sort of screened and selected by the, the team. Yeah, thanks. You just come back on that. I can I can see where you're saying this safeguarded in there, but it's a very it's a very woolly safeguard. In other words, um, it doesn't actually cover what I was saying. <coughs> in so much as it's down for someone to determine, um, which and someone could just as easily say, well, actual fact, you know, there's only one of those. It's only a little shop. It won't it won't matter. I, I'd I'd be I'd be a lot happier um, if that wording was a bit more precise in restricting it to local businesses um, or tradesmen, yeah, um, unless it was a unique service that was being offered that's not supplied within the local the local area, and I think that that would really put my mind at rest. Um, you know, I'd hate to see Corringham or Stanford when we get to that later, but my objection would be the same in Stanford. Um, you need to promote the local shops, not the ones down the road. Thank you. I think that in terms of the wording you're looking at really goes what we can beyond what we can reasonably apply to an advertisement consent application, but we can, we can obviously send that wording back to the passenger transport unit and that's something they would obviously be aware of from this debate um, but certainly the application itself it should really be considered as a passenger transport ad passenger transport information with adverts rather than sort of being considered as an advert in itself but certainly we can pass that information back to the PTU okay thank you uh, Councillor Arnold yeah, sorry, Joe, I mean, I'll withdraw that because we seem to be drifting into kind of talking about both applications and there was a considerable amount of debate going on as well. So, but Councillor Redsell actually did actually come around to a question in the end, so I'll withdraw mine. Thank you. Uh, Chair, could I just come on the, w yeah. with regard to this point of the advertisements and controls over that? I don't think we can go as far as the planning condition for the reason Jonathan's actually raised in terms of uh, reading the test under uh, planning conditions. But... I see the possibility to put an informative on to suggest uh, preference would be given to local advertisements. So certainly there could be a wording that could be put on as recommending that would be the preference in terms of what's uh, put on the boards. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think how we how you actually sort of define what define what local is actually because that's sort of anybody's game, isn't it? Really. Um, I was wondering if maybe the, maybe maybe a, a, an answer to this maybe for local traders. I mean, I can't speak. It's it's commercial enterprise, so I can't actually speak for that. Uh, local traders would get a preferential rate um, for advertising, and and that by way is actually um, giving them the incentive to actually promote their own business. Which, when all said and done, it is a busy hub, uh, you know, and these guys do need to be supported. Um, and it would then actually open up doors for them to actually promote their own businesses locally. Okay. Right, so, uh, sorry, I just want to clarify where we are. So, I'm going to go Councillor Redsell, then Councillor Watson, and then I've got Steve Taylor online with his hand up. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I haven't really got a question. Just a quick apology to, to um, Jonathan, really, because as getting this late and being asked late to come here, um, there is consultation on there online, um, and there was only two objectors, so it's on page 94. So my apologies to you, Jonathan, because I didn't see that. And yeah, I sorry, read we, it all. Yeah, we, we consulted. I don't know if the PTU consulted. I think that was I think that was the question I was being asked. So I don't know if the PTU consulted, but we, we did, yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Watson. Just really quickly on, on this totem itself, um, who bears a risk on it in terms of if it's broken or it's vandalised or anything? Is that born with the risk of the of transport? The, sorry, the maintenance, just reading from what the PTU have told me, the maintenance is covered by the thorough share of the revenue, which makes these units cost neutral. So the money that we would get 
our share of the advertising revenue would cover those costs. I think that would come out of that. Do you know any more, Matt? That's not classified as maintenance. Yeah, it comes out of the. It comes out of the same. So we've same got all the risk. We're bearing all the risk if anything goes wrong with these. Well, we're, we get, but the money is coming. Sorry, the money is coming from the advertising revenue. So we're we're not paying the money. It's our share of the advertising revenue would cover those those costs. Yeah. So the risk is on us. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Arnold. Yeah, sorry. Can I just clarify that a little bit further, actually, because it's a very interesting point. In in the um, unlikely event that it's a it's a total loss someone puts their van through it um so we are liable to actually reinstate that piece of equipment sorry chair if i may come in um it's very similar to our bus shelters in that they are technically insured and if a van drove through any piece of street furniture we can reclaim that back through the insurance companies okay Oh, yeah, uh, sorry, Steve Taylor, uh, you've been with us very patient all evening. Uh, Steve, have you got a question for us? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I, I think I'm suffering slightly with two problems. One is connectivity and the other one is probably my own ears. So if, I, if these answers have already been clarified, I'm going to apologise up front. But, but as I looked at this, my thinking went down the old-fashioned uh, road, like me, of what, where, when, where, why. And so, so my first question is, who is it that's actually funding it? Is it, is it the transport, i.e. British, what, what was British Rail or whatever they call themselves these days, or is it the council, or is it who? Who's funding it, Jonathan? So the, the passenger transport unit had funding for putting in the new replacement bus shelters, which included these structures in themselves. So the, but the long-term maintenance of them will be funded by the advertising revenue, the share of the advertising revenue that comes to the council. So it's, it's part of a wider project for replacement bus shelters and infrastructure. Which is owned by the council? Which, yes. Yes, okay, that's what I'm trying to get at. So, so fundamentally, the council are funding it. So, so then the decision that was made about the locations, which I know you've answered that to some extent and said, well, they came up with some decisions, but do we know what their criteria were? Was it just based on footfall in a particular location or, or is there something a little more um, scientific than, you know, wet string and elastic bands, as it were? Matt's going to come on in this one, Steve. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know the exact criteria per se. Um, it's been down, located down as footfall. It may be a combination of the number of people in a given area looking at the totems for the advertisement side, but it may also be the number of footfall in terms of people in a town centre location that may utilise bus services in the area. Um, you know, for example, the, the Greys example is the totems are in right in the heart of the town centre, right near to uh, George's Street, and there's another one right outside the campus because those two areas had the highest number of footfall in that area, and there's also a third one at the train station between the train station entrance and the bus station. So that's kind of how that analysis was worked out in the Greys one but I'm not too sure about the Corringham sites because I wasn't involved in that process. No, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you, Matt. It, it was just, I'm, I was kind of assuming it was something to do with the number of chimney pots around it, the footfall through the region and so on. That, that makes much more sense. So, so that's, the, that's, if you like, the first two questions I answered. So the third part, as I understand it, is the way this is going to be monetized is that whoever it is that pays for the advertising pays a body. Is that the... Is that Thorough Council or is it some, a third party? Do we know? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so um, if I may if you indulge me, it's very similar to what we've done with the electric vehicle charging points, which is we've got a, um, 
management company to manage the infrastructure. The council implements the infrastructure through a bid. Um, we have a management company that manages it. In this instance, it's JMW Media. They um, advertise and they are responsible for the advertisers on it. They do all of that for us. And then we profit share from those advertisements and that then pays for the ongoing maintenance and upkeep of the infrastructure moving forward, which is very similar to the electric vehicle charging provision. So it's a cost neutral to the council. So we're not spending so, okay, money that, every that's, that's, year. That's, that's fabulous. Thanks, Matt, because that's, that was kind of where I was thinking this might end up. So basically the council has the capital expenditure, the people that manage that then um, do the advertising and manage that part of it. And they and the council then um, share some kind of a margin out of the, the determined profit. So as, when you're saying that should cover the maintenance and so on, it's therefore cash neutral. That's fair enough. I get that. But equally, it would be cash neutral if we did nothing. And if that's the case, then I'm not sure how helpful that is. But it was just what I was trying to get my head around. If it's just, this is just dissemination of information, and question mark, is, is it the most cost effective way of doing it? That, you don't have to answer that. That was just where my head was. So, um, but thanks for the answers, Matt and, and um, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Yep, thank you. Sorry, Chair. Can I just come back and, and put it into another context? So, bus shelters have real time information at the shelter, they also have advertisement at the shelter, and that helps pay for the real time information and the upkeep and maintenance of the shelter. So, it's a very similar sort of concept. This is Effectively, this is real-time information with advertisement without a shelter because it's located in a high footfall area away from the bus shelter. So you don't have to walk to the bus shelter and go, I'm with us, it's 20 minutes, I'll go back into the town centre. That sort of, to put it blunt. Yeah, no, I got that. I absolutely get it. Thanks, thanks, Matt. That's, that's fine. I absolutely get it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Redsell, and then we'll come to some form of conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just coming back on something Steve said, I think probably if there's no monetary value in something, I think probably the councillors in the air would rather see something, having this structure put up, would rather see something coming back into the ward to do something, you know, so I think that, that might be a good thing. If you're going to get some money coming back from it, then perhaps Corringham or whatever, if they saw something coming back and being a benefit to the area, it might be a better way of doing it. I don't know if that's possible, Matt. Um, thank you, Chair. I think in context, if members were minded to refuse this, the project leader would probably make a decision on whether or not to look at an alternative location in another part of the borough that may be soon more suitable, or they may reinvest it into other shelters in other locations very similar to what um, we do but it wouldn't necessarily be the money comes out of that and goes into a completely different project because it's all wrapped up in the real-time information and bus shelters provision under that project okay thank you uh steve lydiard thank you yeah th thanks chair i mean i'm a, a regular bus and train user and i find them really really useful and i suspect if everybody else here was a regular bus and train user, uh, they may have different views. Um, like Matthew said, there's there's lots of these little sort of um, display boards in, in the various bus shelters around the town. And uh, quite frankly, I find the adverts irritating because you're just waiting to find out when your bus is gonna turn up and when you can get on the bus. You know, I ignore the adverts totally. Oh, this is more debate, really, Chair. So I apologise. Um, so, so personally, I think I think they're fantastic things. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, that's a good time to filter into debate. So, so thanks for that, uh, Councillor Lydiard. Um, all right then. So uh, we'll we'll now debate. Uh, give us your opinions, and then we'll head to the officer recommendations. Um, I'll start on this one. Personally, I don't have an issue with with uh, this particular totem uh, in in its current location. Um, but uh, over to yourselves um, and see what you think. Uh, Councillor Arnold, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I am a regular train user, actually, aren't I? 
<laughs> these things all over the place, yeah. Um, yeah, this really is a sort of double-edged sword for me, actually. I, uh, and I'm listening. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously a, a frequent user of the, t the, the, t the town centre. I'm up there virtually every day. Um, and I, not obviously I do. I do have, um, let's, let's say, sympathies for, obviously, shopkeepers actually still trying to earn a living and make a viable business out of these things. So I do understand the argument that's put forward um, that it would actually take away business from those. Um, so this, this is a double-edged thing, but, but we are in a free market world here. Do you know what I mean? And, and it is, maybe it's for people to actually promote their own business via this kind of uh, equipment. Um, and the other, the other side of it is, you know, it, 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 and I, I truly am undecided on this at the minute, but it would be a shame if Corringham um, were not to have the opportunity for this uh, equipment um, and, it, and it to be lost somewhere else. Surely that is surely that is a, 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 a s something that signifies that Corringham isn't moving forward with the modern world. I mean, there are arguments on both sides, and I do completely understand both sides. But why why let an opportunity go when it's you know when, when we are talking about the real modern world here? And, and I do understand that there are there are businesses up there trading that probably you wouldn't find elsewhere, and, and all credit to them. But, that, but they should be looking at where they are and, and, the, op and, the, and the, the facilities they have locally to them and, and tap into that. Embrace, embrace the change, embrace what's, what opportunity there is. But I do completely understand the other side of the coin. Okay, who's next? Um, uh, Councillor Piccolo. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> My, my, I say my, my concern has been um, about who's enabled to advertise on the board. Um, I think there's two or three opticians in Corringham. Um, <clears throat> be great if Specsavers had a great big sign on there saying, you know, come to Specsavers at Basildon or Specsavers at Grays. And by the way, if you've got a bus pass, it won't cost you anything to get there anyway. Um, that's my point about it needs to be some control on who can advertise on them. If it's going to be at the detriment of the local traders and businesses, then I'm against it. As long as I feel that adequate protection can be put in place so that you haven't got their rivals from outside of the area um, promoting their businesses and taking trade away from Corringham, then I'm happy for them to go ahead. But I need that sort of assurance. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Polly and then Councillor Watson and Lydiard, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, advertising in the right place is premium. And one of the things that advertisers do like is to try and get onto British Rail stations and sites. And they've got a real tight control on that. And they demands an extortionate return for their buck. So I, I can see, I, I was thinking of like the Chafford 100 railway station, the little sh shopping precinct there, the footfall there would be. I, I, I don't know what, again, with, with the council outsourcing it to a third party, we're putting our trust, there's no, there's nothing from that I've heard that would that that media company isn't being asked to achieve certain targets, certain revenues through advertising. We've got no guarantee. They, they've got no risk if they find advertisers for it. All well and good, and and we get a return. And if they don't get advertised advertisements within those podiums, then then. The council is taking all the risk again. I also think that against the, against the national trend, Corringham has still got a vibrant uh, shopping centre. And those traders have got an active traders association. And 
I think if there was merit in something like this type of scheme, if they, they would be coming to us to say, can we have an advertising board or, or can we have... A, so, you, you know, I am a little bit of a believer in talk to the people who are doing the job rather than somebody that's remotely saying what's needed in a particular area. I, do, I don't know how long the, ago the original um, site specifications were drawn up, but we, we've got massive development in in West Lyre and South Stifford in the Lakeside Basin. We've got a lot of new people. We've got potential new development still to come to Perfleet on Thames. I, th I think there are better sites for this that would serve our residents better, probably give them better footfall and, and in the long run, generate more revenue for, for the council um, so, I and, I and I still I still do have a concern. L Lakeside, with its entertainment and that now, is becoming more of a not a twenty four hour culture, but certainly a sort of an eighteen hour culture. Where Coringham isn't. That still does have a, a finished time. Um, there isn't the nightlife there. There isn't. So I I, I just can. I can just see this, this, this totem just blaring away, glowing away to itself in the dark, and I, I, I don't think that's something that suits the the location of it. So, um, with all things considered, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not against the totem. I'm just not sure that this was the right site for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that took us to Councillor. Steve, did you have another, did you want to comment? Yeah, go on, sorry, thank you. I can't imagine standing outside a butcher's right where that totem is and saying, I know, I'm going to go to Lakeside to get my meat. I mean, you know, I see these um, display boards probably several times a week and I have never, ever thought to myself, oh, I must travel another five miles to get get something different. Most of these adverts tend to be national things, you know, like, oh, don't drink and drive, don't do this, don't do that. You know, gov government advice, stuff about, um, you know, would you like to be a foster parent and, uh, and things like that. They don't tend to be, if you're in Corringham, you know, or go... Go to Gray's, there's a better, uh, you know, spec savers or something like that. I think it's just a little bit of fear from the, the traders in Corringham. Um, and I, I really don't see a, a, a problem at all, to be honest, especially as a regular bus user. Okay, thank you. John, did you want to come in there? Sorry. Yeah, just wanted to sort of been a sort of sum up of, of what it is and having heard all members comments the the proposal is essentially for a public transport display showing bus times and public transport information um, I've taken understand members comments about the adverts but primarily it should be looked at as a sort of public transport information system with adverts as a secondary part of it um, we can't again I take um, councillors comments that there might be other locations where we could put these boards where there might be a different level of footfall but similar to the previous application about the HMO we can't prejudge what other sites may come forward we're looking at the the application that's in front of us at the moment um, and the regulations in terms of the advertisement consent are quite tight in what can be considerations and those are highway safety and visual amenity grounds so the debate or not the debate the the final recommendation if it's a different recommendation, would need to be focused on those those two grounds, highway safety and visual amenity, stroke character and appearance. So whilst I appreciate members may have some concerns, I, we need to make sure that we focus the, the discussion and final discussion on those sort of points. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, over to Councillor Watson. Thank you. 
And on that basis, no, I don't want to talk to him in Corringham. And that, uh, so I'm going to reject the re proposal, as you don't want us to say anything else about our personal preference or where we've got to do because it's immaterial. So, but I will say this, there's higher footfalls in this borough and putting the government things on like don't drink or drive, shove it in the middle of Lakeside and that's exactly what you should be do doing. Mm -hmm. So, my personal opinion is I, I just don't think Corringham has got the football, footfall or football to actually like benefit properly out of this totem than what you want to do because where we want to put it and would like to put it is where there is a train station with bus terminals, intersections and everything else for them to maximise the information that is on it. So, thank you. Okay, add about another three more hands there. Um, let's go to Councillor Redsell, obviously in debate phase, thank you. It's only a quick one, Chair, thanks. Perhaps just to ask Jonathan that, um, the, the, where it's gonna be designatedly put, is there flats above the shops there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I believe so, so yeah. if it's well lit and it's going all night, it could be detrimental to the people who live in those flats, yeah? But it, yeah, it does, it would have sensors, so it wouldn't, the, the light levels would sort of react to the, the ambient background light, so it wouldn't, yeah, it would be sort of sensitive to what's there, but yeah, I believe there are maze nets in the area, but there are, there are other bits of street furniture, so there's street lights which would give off lights as well, but yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. I only asked that because one of the objectors said it's outside her property and I couldn't think of any properties, so I had to realise there must be flats above. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Arnold, your hand was raised. Thanks, Chair. I'll keep it very brief. Um, yeah, there just seems to have been a little bit going around this evening, my perception, a uh, little bit of negativity about Corrigan. It is actually an extremely busy town centre. Um, and what some of the discussion has been about tonight is would it be detrimental to the shopkeepers themselves? That I am still split on, but it is it is a busy town centre, and on that side of the borough, it is a lead, it is a lead town centre. So I'm going to leave it there. But and, and obviously there are busier areas, but on that side, it's up there. Okay, thank you. All right then, uh, Councillor Lydiard. Mr. Quickie, Chair. Yeah, I'm not sure how many of these display boards there are around Thurrock, but the very small ones and the very big ones. I mean, there must be 30 or 40 at least, I would have thought. And they are in Lakeside. They are by the stations. Is it only me that, that sees them? And why shouldn't Corringham have one? Why shouldn't Stanford Lee Hope have one? Um, everywhere else has got them, as far as I can see. Okay. Uh, all right, then. So I think everyone's <coughs> contributed on the debate phase, so thanks for those uh, contributions. Um, I must admit, I'm not sure how this vote's going to go. So what I will do, unless anyone comes up with an alternative recommendation, I could go to the, the vote of re, uh, recommendation. Councillor Byrne, you have your hands raised? N no, sorry. Thank you. Um, so unless anyone raises uh, an objection, I, I can go forward with the approval, subject to conditions, and we can see where that vote ends up. And if it, if it loses, we'll, we'll go to alternative recommendation, okay? If anyone's happy with that, I'll move, I'll move the vote. So, um, I will move that we do approve this scheme here in, uh, in Corringham, uh, agenda item 11, uh, subject to conditions. Um, is that seconded? Okay, thank you. And uh, we'll move to the vote. I think there's eight votes on this. All those in favour? Okay, that's three votes in favour. Okay, uh, all those against? Four against and um, uh, abstentions? One abstention. Okay, so uh, that, that um, recommendation was refused. Uh, who would like to recommend uh, an alternative? Uh, Councillor Polly, thank you. So, I. Uh, I move to recommend for refusal. Is that seconded? Those in favour for refusal. 
Uh, sorry, Chair, oh, could sorry. we potentially have a, a reason for the refusal? Sorry. Yeah, sure. You did. I thought that come at the end. No, sorry. No, it doesn't. I don't know the last one. Okay, so I, I'm just being uh, supported by the officers here. I, my reasons for refusal would be because of highways impact and visual. Uh, sorry, highways reasons and and uh, visual impact on street scene. So. Is that seconded? Those supporting the refusal. Those against the refusal. Three again. And, and abstentions. So it's the application just refused. If Sorry. We could just have a bit more clarification about exactly what the highways impact and what the visual amenity concerns. I don't know if legal wanted to come in at all. As in to supply reasons or to explain that reasons need to be defensible? Well, the latter. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so you, you've given two reasons referring to um, transport, uh, highways impact and uh, street, streetscape uh, design. Um, that is sort of a general reason, but we need specifics about what it is in those two categories that actually mean this must be refused. If it helps, Chair, perhaps in terms of highway impacts, we're talking more about street clutter because um, you've already got lighting, various bins, and you're just adding to that general clutter on, on the streets. And I'm not sure, in terms of the visual impact, I think it was alluded to in terms of uh, light spill, in terms of it being an illuminated information board. Yeah, I mean, I think we just touched on it there, really. I mean... It, it, I think it's it's the lighting is another side of it as well because there are residential flats really all around there um, and late at night it, it can be argued that it would be a, a light disturbance. Yeah, that's yeah, we'll take that then. Okay, thank you very much for your contributions there, uh, everyone. Right, so we've still got two more items on the agenda. Uh, it's coming up to nine p.m. Um, uh, excellent. Yeah, yes, a two-minute comfort break, is that? <coughs> yeah, please, three-minute comfort break, thank you. Okay, okay, we're live, thank you. Okay, then, ladies and gentlemen, oh, you're all right. Okay. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, that then takes us on to, uh, we've got two more items on the agenda. Uh, agenda item 10, um, that is uh, land adjacent to 21 Kings Parade, King Street, Stamfordley Hope. Um, John, if you'd be so kind as to uh, give your report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Again, very similar to the previous application. So it's an advert for from the passenger transport unit team for an information board displaying bus times and associated adverts. So this is the um, King Street in Stamford, running north to south, and the totem would be located on the built-out area to the southern part of the high street, outside premise shop number one. Again, same totem as proposed in the previous application. Um, and this is the location of the site. So it's behind that street furniture, behind the bin in this picture. And looking at it from the south, it's in the approximate location just behind the bin where my cursor is. So again, the application is in town centre. Public transport information signs are found to be acceptable in these locations. Design is acceptable. And there were no highways objections from the highways team when the application was considered. So approval is recommended. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, obviously, I don't probably think there'll be as many questions on this because I think we've we really have gone uh, you know a lot, a lot into these totems. So really, probably just focus on location. Any sort of questions like that? Who would like to start? Uh, Councillor Redsill. Just make a small observation. I know I'm not on planning all the time, so I, I've got no probably way to say. But could we make the mapping a bit better? You know, because it, it, we're so outdated, aren't we? Surely we can have names of roads and. And everything, because somebody looking at that from general public wouldn't know where it is at all. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I know. In, I know. In the yeah. past, we've had these pre-planned packs. Um, that's, that's something we went with. Uh, I, I don't think there was one sent out this month. So if we can keep on top of that, that'd be great. I know they're a little bit more um, detailed. Um, so thanks for that observation, Councillor Redsell. Uh, any questions? No, no, no questions. Um, Councillor Byrne, thank you. Yeah, well, I put, it's not a question, it may be a question of debate, but anyway, this spend, I know um, Councillor Arnold has said progress, but we, uh, we cannot forget, we spent tens of thousands of pounds on hundreds of, hundreds of advertising signs in Greys, and we've had one penny return, so we have to be careful that we don't invest into things like this. We've actually got, we pay someone a wage not to give us any revenue on them hundred advertising bowls and it just costs us thousands and thousands. So we have to be careful what we are putting planning in for. It's not going to come back to bite us. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't think it was a, a question here, but thank you, thank you for, for, for raising that. Um, okay, right, uh, no questions. So we will head straight into debate. Who would like to start on this one? Okay, Councillor Lydiard. It's just a point that I hadn't made before, and that is I've never seen any antisocial behaviour, any smashing of these display boards um, in all the time I've been using buses and trains. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Watson, debate, thank you. Thank you. No, I, I agree with Councillor Lydiard. And, and before you can even bring that into the equation, you would like to see some data around that. Uh, so, footfall... What is the differential between the Covington and the King Street one? Or is there one? I, I don't have the figures for for the two sites. I was the information I was given from the passenger transport unit was these two sites were chosen because of a high level of footfall, but they I don't have the exact figures for them. Thank you, Councillor Piccolo. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I haven't seen them and where it's, where it's proposed um, to be placed. Um, I haven't got a problem with that. The only proviso I have is the same as I said before. Um, I'd like where possible priority, be, priority to be given to local shops and businesses within... Yeah, I'd like priority to be given to local shops and businesses first to advertise on it rather than going further afield. Um, <clears throat> the, um, yeah, I think that was, I think that was basically what I was, I just wanted to be put in place. Um, there was something else, but it's gone out of my mind now. I was having, having to pause for a moment, but uh, <laughs> it will come back. All right. Thank but, you. Yeah, so I'd like the same sort of provisos on who can advertise on it put in place. Thank you. Yeah, if, uh, if it is approved, we could we could look into that under condition. Um, right, so we're in the debate phase. I'm just going to go over to Steve Taylor as he's got his hand raised and then over to Councillor Byrne. Thanks, Chair. I, 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 I did ping a little message out while you were taking a break, but, but really all I, I, my comment was I'm, I'm sort of fairly ambivalent towards the totems. I can see I, I like the value of the, the immediate accurate information about you know, buses delayed and, and, and taxi, uh, sorry, and, and trains delayed. And, and, and I think that's a great thing. My big worry about this whole thing is it, it's just going outside of what I would consider is the council's sort of core skill sets and getting involved in advertising and with, with commercial organisations, which is definitely not its strong suit. And, and equally, if the council is putting out the capital and the revenues don't cover the cost of, of maintenance and potentially, and I take Steve's point, vandalism, you don't normally get it. Well, you never know. 
But if it doesn't cover that, who the hell is it picks picks you know picks the bill up at the end of it? That's that's my worry. It's my concern. Outside of that, I don't have any issue with it. So that's just my comments. Thanks, Chair. I'll put my hand down and I'll leave you in peace. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Um, right, over to Councillor Byrne and Councillor Piccolo. Well, I'm not going to say, but will, will you guys tell us the expected revenue from this pod in Corringham? Because I know it's that figure and it's unbelievably high. It's there for the money, not for the, not for the shopkeepers. OK, thank you, Councillor Piccolo. Yeah, just to, just to quickly, I remember what I, what I was going to uh, say now. Um, regarding the, uh, the, the shopping centres, the figures are f go back about four years, but in actual fact, Stanford Lee Hope Town Centre shopping and business outside of Lakeside and Greys is the biggest shopping area in Thurrock, um, and I believe Corringham is a close third. Um, so they are both large areas which get plenty of footfall, so um, um, it will be useful, but that's my concern that we take some of that footfall away. And that's why I'd like to concentrate on the local uh, local businesses. OK, thank you. Um, was there any further, uh, anyone who wanted to debate before we come to some form of conclusion? Um, Councillor Polly, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I just would like to say that I, I think the sighting of this is much better. And it, it's not just the shop for, for where it is sighted. It, 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 there are public transport links there and there's a lot of footfall backwards and forwards and I, and I think it will serve uh, the residents better than the previous application. Um, I just wanted you to add that seeing as I'd objected to the previous one. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shinnick, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm mindful to vote for this one because I think it's situated in a lot better position for the residents of Stanford. Thank you, Councillor Shinnick. Uh, Councillor Arnold? I would actually put up a contrary to that. I, I actually think this is in a worse position because it's, uh, it's kind of an open... It's approaching an open piece of footpath. And for me there, it's just, it's just clutter. It's big clutter. And I think the, the Corrigan one, if we're going to go back to that one, is... I don't know, it, it, it sort of fits there. I know I objected to it because of the light, etc., etc. But I think there, actually, it's even more obvious and out of place. It's a very difficult decision, this. OK, thank you. Um, all right, then. So what we'll do, uh, if that's everyone uh, has contributed there, thank you so much. Uh, we will head to the vote. Again, like last time, I'll go to the, uh, the, the recommendation for approval and we'll see where we end up. Um, all right, then. So uh, recommendation for approval, uh, King Street, Stanford Lee Hope. This is the totem. Um, I'll recommend approval. Is that seconded? Seconded by Councillor Lydiard. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hands. Six, yeah. Uh, pick a low. Cool. Six, okay. All those against? <coughs> okay. Um, all right then. Excellent. So that, 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 has, uh, that has passed based on that vote. So thank you everyone for your contributions there. And then that does take us on to the uh, item of urgent business that is the, uh, the pink paper. Um, exempt, yeah? Yep, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, obviously, just to clarify, apologies, this is an exempt <coughs> item. So members of the public, unfortunately, um, have to have to leave. I do apologise. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, well, I could speak with legal if you like. But what if, I mean, I could speak with legal just to see if there's anything that can be done there or? Well, hang on, let's uh, just hold it there for a second, Councillor Watson. Just, I just want to clarify something.
Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pico, just about to go into exempts. Is there? Okay, thank you. Uh, right, so that's now uh, twenty-one forty-one, and uh, we've now uh, finished the exempt item, and that is now the close of the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your attendance, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, everyone.